All right. Good morning, everybody. Let's get this uh, meeting started. Uh, this is the regular monthly open meeting of the Third Laguna Hills Mutual Board of Directors. It's a California nonprofit benefit corporation. Today is Tuesday, April 18th, 2023, and it's 9 a.m. We're here in the boardroom as well as available for viewing on TV6, Zoom, and Granicus. Uh, I'd like to call today's meeting to order. Uh, I see that we have a quorum. Um, we're going to start today's meeting with our Pledge of Allegiance, led by Director Ralph Engdahl. Ralph? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, Ralph. Uh, it's now time to approve today's agenda. Can I get a motion to approve today's agenda? Ira moves. Donna seconds, thank you. Some corrections. Okay, correction, great, thanks. On page 212B, we want to move that to future agenda because we still have some more discussion with uh, the villas okay. to so, look at it. Okay, so 12B is the washer-dryer standard, so That's we're going to push that standard to the suggestions is push that to future agenda items. And then on 15H, I'm no longer on that. Committee, does SK or Moon yes, SK will have be, the ability to? SK will be ready to take care of that. Okay. And other than that, oh, so same with the disaster tax, uh, with the that, uh, that is. mobility vehicles. Yeah, that's moved under K. Moved to K. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Any other suggested changes? Anybody have any objections to those changes? Okay, seeing none. Oh, uh, you're just waving high, right? <laughs> okay, okay, great. Um, then we'll consider the agenda with those minor changes uh, approved, and we'll move on to agenda item four, looking to approve meeting minutes for four different meetings. Let's address them each separately. First, can I get a motion to approve the meeting minutes for last month's open board meeting held on March 21st? Chris moves, Ira seconds, thank you. Any suggested changes or corrections to those minutes? Seeing none, we'll consider them approved. Um, Michaela's Kush on Zoom. Yes, he is, I'll move him on Zoom right now. Okay, just wanna make sure that if his hand is raised that somebody's watching, because I can't see it here. All right, uh, the next uh, meeting minutes we're looking at to approve. Can I get a motion to approve the meeting minutes for the third budget workshop held on March 30th? Uh, Chris moves. Okay. Andy seconds, thank you both. Any suggested corrections or changes to those? Seeing none, we'll consider them approved as well. The third set of meeting minutes, uh, we'd like to get a motion to approve the meeting minutes for the annual audit meeting held on April 6th. Uh, Andy moves, uh, Ira seconds, thank you both. Any suggested corrections, changes? Looking around, seeing none. Um, consider those approved by consent. And finally, can I get a motion to approve the minutes for the agenda prep meeting held on April 7th? Ira moves, Donna seconds, thank you. Any suggested changes? Seeing none, hearing none, we'll consider those approved as well. Thank you all for that. Moving on to agenda item number five, the report of the chair. I uh, have a couple quick things here to talk about. Uh, one of the items on today's agenda is for the board to approve the 2023 election schedule. Uh, there, will be, there will be four board director terms expiring uh, in October of this year. If you're out there, um, you have some available time and you have some ideas about how you'd like to improve our community, please consider volunteering to join the board uh, during the annual election process this year. It looks like some people in the audience are considering volunteering right now. Thank you. 
Um, also, as a reminder, the budget process for uh, next year has begun. This effort, which completes in September, uh, will determine what the monthly assessment is for third mutual members for next year. I feel that uh, determining the yearly budget is one of the most important and one of the most difficult roles of board members. Our job is to balance the maintenance and services that we want provided for our members uh, and our property with the cost to provide those efforts and services. As we all know, the cost of everything is going up, including the cost of staff and supplies, which are the main components of the cost incurred by the mutuals. Third Mutual's yearly budget for 2023 is almost $41 million. A budget increase of only $73,000 would mean $1 per manor per month uh, increase. So just to give you some perspective. All of the boards, along with staff, have been working to identify and implement efficiencies to help offset these rising costs, but the efficiencies identified may not be enough. Um, along with rising operating costs, our aging infrastructure is starting to require more funds to maintain each year. And on top of that, this board is interested in making some investments now that will save even more money for our members in later years. Things like speeding up the effort to reline our pipes to minimize leaks and the cost to handle those leaks. And the transitioning of our landscaping uh, to that which takes less water and less maintenance. In fact, Director Lewis will be leading a discussion later today in our meeting uh, about an idea he has regarding landscape transition. The purpose of me sharing this information about budgets is really to urge you all to get involved uh, in the budget process, attend meetings, and don't hesitate to share your thoughts and perspectives regarding services and spending. The next official budget meeting for Third Mutual is on Wednesday, May 31st at 9.30 a.m. here in the boardroom where the initial 2024 budget proposals for maintenance and construction as well as general services will be discussed. Then on the next day, Thursday, June 1st at 9.30 a.m. here in the boardroom, there will be another budget meeting where the initial 2024 budget proposal for landscaping services will be discussed. So again, uh, please get involved, help us out. And that concludes my remarks for today. As always, thanks for listening and thanks for your support. We'll now move on to agenda item six. Uh, pres oh, oh. President Laws, uh, I believe Director Bada has a comment. He has his hand okay. raised. Uh, good Thank morning, you. everybody. Okay. Sorry, I was not able to join you in person. But uh, Mark, I would like to mention that we have lost one of our past uh, board members, John Frankel, and uh, our sincere condolences to the family. And uh, we truly appreciate all the time and effort that he had uh, put in while he was there. Um, other than that, I want to uh, just say that I will be intermittently in and out of the meeting. So please excuse me for that. Okay. Thanks, Kush. Thanks yeah, thank for you. bringing that up. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. No, um, and your hand is still up, Kush, so if you could... Thank you. Getting it done. <laughs> you, 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 sorry, I'm faster than you, I guess, this morning. Yeah. All right. Okay, moving on to agenda item six, we'll now have an update from the VMS board. VMS board director and chair, Rosemary DiLorenzo, is providing today's update. Good morning, Rosemary. Good morning, uh, Mr. President, uh, the hardworking and illustrious third board, our CEO, our staff, and the residents. I thank you for giving us the uh, us, I, as I say us, it's the VMS board, not me, the opportunity to update you on what is uh, happening, especially with the VMS board, because Siobhan talks about what's happening with VMS, the organization. Uh, as you know, we started the Bright Idea program in January, and although uh, we wish that we had, you know, 20 ideas a week. We have had, I believe, five bright ideas, which is really excellent. The uh, program is being organized um, at, or administered by uh, Robert Carroll, who also who is in charge of resident services, and we really know him as in charge of trash vehicles. But he has taken this on, so we're excited. Uh, we <clears throat> and he and he also works with this on our human resources director. Uh, this past week. We um, honored 
the first Bright Idea Award winner, and she received a, a check of $1,000. And, and she devised a new method for paying franchise tax fees, which will save us uh, $20,000 plus a year, which is really very good. And uh, we do have uh, five more suggestions, not four, so five more suggestions uh, that we have received that are being evaluated and will be presented to us. So, so that's exciting to us. Uh, people keep asking us, well, shouldn't we be having a Bright Idea program for the community? And we've talked about that. And the thing is, is we're afraid that it might turn into a Bright Idea box for complaints. And then we don't know who is going to administer it. So we want to be really successful with this employee program. And then we will probably be organized enough to pursue the resident uh, program. Um, so the other thing that we had do, and we do this monthly or quarterly, Siobhan, the strategic plan update. Every other month. Every other month. See, I was wrong on both counts. So um, we have the strategic plan update. <laughs> and one of our, so it's every other month. And we want to attract, develop, and retain high-quality staff. And we have introduced um, something new, which is expanding the use of inter integrated resources within the village by providing more employment opportunities for disabled workers at no cost to the village. Uh, programs such as this have been in existence for years. I know that we use these very often in the hospitality business because there were so many different levels of, of employees. And uh, we were successful for years by with someone who um, worked in as a phone operator because you know there were so many calls coming in, and she did a fabulous job. Though we also had situations where if you hired someone with a disability, uh, some of the other employees weren't as kind as they should be. So, so it's a, always a work in progress. But I'm happy that we have decided um, to to work in this way. And um, I don't know, Siobhan, if, do we have any areas where we have put employees in already? Yes, we have someone working at the equestrian center, and he's doing a fabulous job. Okay, that's great. Uh, you know, and, and a lot, sometimes they could be a great person to work in resident services. So it's just to work the program and see what uh, we can get. It's not really done. Well, I shouldn't say that because you can say that's crazy. It's not really done to save money, but it is done to save money. But it's also done to give an opportunity to people to add to their lives, to fulfill their, their lives better. So, so it's good for us in both ways. So I know we're working on it. And uh, one of the other things that we're doing is uh, facilitate operational excellence, where we're looking at different, at some departments more than others. I know that Siobhan and the staff would look at all the departments, but there's some departments more where you could look at streamlining operations and, and what, and save money, because the only way, and we know this, we've talked to the board, the only way for us to be successful is to look at our, our operations and to make them more efficient. And we have to look at things where we're um, possibly wasting, wasting payroll, you know, and, and I know a million years ago when we used to send someone to work on your house, I know I've said this before, we send two people because we couldn't trust one person. You know, and that was all changed. So it's to look at these these things that might have been a habit forever and and to update them and change them and make them cost effective. I see Ira looking at me. He probably has a million ideas for landscaping, so I'm not even going to go there. Uh, <laughs> the other thing is, is, is we also working on the tracking of service requests. And um, the next item on our list is KPI reporting. I know that we worked on the KPI reporting tracking or reporting. Uh, Mark, your president, was part of our group. And we wanted to do reports on things that really matter. Well, everything really matters. But some things matter more. But we also wanted to do things that weren't going to take a tremendous amount of, tremendous amount of time to track. Because eventually, notice I say eventually, when we have the ERP program, we could just have a list of a bazillion things we want to track. So we didn't want to have an employee dedicated to tracking. So we selected a few, a few items. One of them was the financial um, performance of recreation events. You might not think that that's big, but that costs you money. 
if it doesn't if it doesn't work well. We're not talking about room rental. That isn't part of what we're talking about. Don't want to go there. But we're talking about if we don't charge enough for somebody's Thanksgiving dinner and we do a report and we have to subsidize somebody's Thanksgiving dinner, that isn't well done. Because although we do with shared cost, I don't need to share the cost of your having a meal. Or if a dance is held and it is not effectively done financially, it's, it, the thing is, is I really don't have to pay for you going to a dance. So we have shared cost in the sense of the, the clubhouses and the clubs. Again, that is a discussion forever. But on these things, we're really evaluating them. And it's a simple formula that our finance department has put together, and we've added to it, and it's working. I know that I believe we have addressed the price that we're charging for the holiday meals. And we also know, like, we had a dance and we lost money on it. So, like, no more dances, you know, that we will host. Uh, the clubs host enough dances. So it's something that's working, and we're happy with it. The other thing that we have done uh, in this area was improve the timeline for real estate closings. Um, I know we've talked about this before, where when the paperwork is put in, it is evaluated almost immediately, at least the same day. So then if there's anything missing, we send it, we give it back right away. So your, your form isn't sitting on the desk, not correctly done for a few days. Then we get to it, then we tell you, then it keeps waiting. And we're really gonna look at something like this for manner alterations also. So Jim could get all involved in that one. But um, the other thing that we have is the, I keep going back and forth with Catherine on this, the continuous service improvement program. Uh, this is a method that is used in business to structure internal improvements and develop a better service culture. And we have introduced this in resident services as a customer service escalation process. So if something isn't going right, we have a plan in place to escalate it and to correct it. And we're going to expand this into other areas. I know one of the areas that we talked about expanding it into was when, when something is closing and we, and we suddenly say to the restaurant, oh, by the way, you owe us blah, blah, blah. And it's in our system or it's not in our system. So I know that we're looking at this, this process this continuous service improvement process for other areas. So if anybody is, has any ideas about that or interests, please, uh, Catherine is really running that program. So um, I think that that's very exciting. Uh, as far as events go, because I'm trying to make this brief, um, last week on Monday, we had a, a, a presentation by the Damage Restoration Department which was very, very well done. And, and I think that one of the things that we have to, we have to remember and appreciate in here, uh, some communities don't do as much as we do on damage restoration. And uh, you know, we are really there to make sure that we don't have mold growing in our buildings. So although it might be a pain or cumbersome, and we know that we have to constantly improve that process, we really, our goal is to preserve the properties that we all live in and we all own. So um, the presentation was really good. Uh, the person in charge of that department is, has, a, has quite a backload, but the um, rain damage has been incredible. So he's very, very busy, and he's working on a program uh, with the boards to speed up uh, past things that have to be done. I know that that has happened for United and is also happening for third. So on the next, so that's something that came up uh, or passed. On May 3rd, we are going to have a manor alterations update at the VMS meeting. And, and we actually put that in the schedule. It wasn't ordinarily regularly in the schedule because we do have a new person who is run, running that department, so to speak, and he has some really good ideas, and this is a perfect time for you to attend the meeting and to ask some questions, because we don't want, really want a, a per, the department head or the manager of a department to come in and, and do what we call the dog and pony show. We want them to tell you what they're doing, but we, we really want you to ask questions so that we could try to improve it. So that's going to be on May 3rd. 
And, and if anybody has any questions that you want to make sure that he addresses, please send the questions um, to Siobhan or to Carlos. Uh, the next thing we're having on the same day, just to make sure that we stay very busy, is we're going to have a real estate forum. We haven't had a real estate forum, I would say, in since pre-COVID, probably. You know, I could use that term. And uh, this is an um, opportunity for real estate people to come in and to ask questions. And it can be quite heated because I've been to them in the past. Um, so I hope that someone or someones from your board attend. Um, I know that I've reserved a seat because I really feel that it's important for us on BMS to know what's going on and to hear what's going on. And we have up there and also in the packet which you received electronically, uh, the email address to make a reservation and you have if you want to have something to discuss um, you could send that in also and we are not serving dinner but for it to be from three to four yeah, it might be a little longer than that but i think this is really important for all of us also upcoming are the employee excellence awards on may 23rd and i would appreciate it and it's and it's up to all of you to have some representation from the board I know that this is something that I always go to, not because they serve snacks or whatever, but because it's important for our employees to see us seeing them honored. So some representation from the boards is good, is very good. So please um, mark it on your calendar if you can. And the next other big event, and I don't think this is right, so Mark, you could correct us, is the client services meeting. Again, the client services meeting is every other month. And we ask you, our clients, to tell us what you would like to see on the agenda. So on June 12th, we're going to talk about accountability and oversight. But it's not only, and Mark, please correct me, of vendors and contractors. It's also of staff, is it not? Yeah, I, I wrote that in. So I, I thought you'd catch that, but I got it too. So, so we want to know who is out there checking on what the people are doing. Uh, because they could note things and improve things. In any case, that is the end of my presentation. I tried to make it brief and informative. And before I run back to my seat, if any of you have any questions, please ask. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Rosemary other than me? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm so, ready. Well, first of all, just a comment. I want to thank all of the bright ideas submitters. I, you know, that's a, you know, we as a board appreciate uh, every effort that uh, anyone can make to try to help save money. Um, and then I was just, I had more of a question. I can work this with uh, Catherine later, but regarding the uh, expanding the CSIP customer service improvement program in other areas. Um, you know, as a board member, I get a lot of complaints about interactions with, um, not to pick on anybody, but landscapers, you know, as, as, as uh, members are interacting with landscapers, I often hear that uh, they aren't as pleasant, perhaps, as they could be. So I'm interested in a way that we can track those types of interactions and uh, help improve those going forward. So that was just my And point. And that, that is, uh, you know, anything that we could bring up. I know that this is something that we use, this, this process uh, is something that we used a lot in hospitality, uh, which is my background, because hospitality was service. And this is, this is like a, a hotel where we, it's a timeshare or whatever, you know. Resort. And it's, it's a resort, yeah, it's a resort, that's what it is. <laughs> and then, but it's 24 hours a day, there's so many similarities. And the thing is, is, is that what we deliver other than you know, maintenance things is service. So to try to improve the service, and I know that Catherine will be very happy to um, hear anything that she need, needs to look at. And you know, if it involves Carlos because he's in charge of operations, that's a great thing. But I, I love that program, and um, I'm sure it will do well for us. In any case, you okay. Thank you, and great. see you later. Thank you, Rosemary. Appreciate the update. All right, we're, we're now gonna move on to agenda item seven, our open forum. At this time, members may address the board of directors regarding items within the jurisdiction of this board of directors and not on the agenda. The board reserves the right to limit the total amount of time allotted to this agenda item to 30 minutes. 
Each member is asked to speak for no more than three minutes. A member may speak only once during the forum and members, uh, speakers may not give their time to other people. Members not in the boardroom can also share their comments by joining this meeting via Zoom or by emailing your comments to meeting at vmsinc.org to have your message read during this open forum, should time permit. Uh, so with that, Michaela, uh, can you? Yes, first speaker is Larry Halperin. Morning, everybody. Good morning. I have some handouts that show the issue that was in my Manner. Oh, anyway. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Larry Halperin. I live at 5541B. I've moved in approximately four and a half years ago. And prior to moving in, my wife and I spent over $100,000 upgrading our manor. One of the things we did was put in a new luxury vinyl plank floor. Here's an example of the floor, luxury vinyl plank floor. And you'll notice on the back of this thing, it's kind of got mold, mold and mildew on it. Can I believe that was caused by excess moisture. Get to the microphone. Yeah. Like this. <laughs> I believe that was caused by excess moisture in the concrete. And so I'll take you through the steps here. Uh, 2018, we get a new luxury vinyl plank floor. Within four or five months, we noticed that the floors were starting to uh, creak and crack and raise. And there's pictures of that in your packet here. Uh, when we called the company that installed the flooring, uh, Tompkins Flooring in Irvine had been in business for over 30 years. They're still in business. Uh, they came in and said, it looks like you've got excessive moisture in your floor. We said, okay, is there a broken pipe? So we called the HOA. And over a three-year period of time, we had the HOA plumbers come out three times to look for leaks. None were ever found. We also had our AAA insurance, homeowners insurance come out. Look for leaks. Again, nothing was found. And this contention between myself and the company, Tompkins, that installed the floor went on and on and on. And we had to get the state licensed contractor board involved. We even went to their bond company up in Los Angeles. Tokyo Marine is their bond company. Presented our case to them that said, we're the consumer. I, I'm not a flooring expert. You're telling me I have high excess moisture in my floor, but yet I don't have any leaks in my floor. I, I, I have the HOA, I have my insurance company. They even sent in an outside professional expert. His conclusion was excess moisture in the concrete. And when I said to them, then you, you're saying in your contract you don't install the floor, the flooring, the planks until the floor has the right, um, the concrete is ready for the floor to be installed. You can't show me that you did that. You did not install plastic, the three mil plastic, which is now required. Back in 2018, the three mil plastic was not a requirement. And you didn't sand or seal the floor. So as a consumer, I paid for the floor, the floor is failing, and you say the floor is failing because of high moisture. Right. So your time is, is up. Can you summarize? Yes, what you, what I will. Like? You... So we got it. The new summary is the uh, bond company said we won our case. I got a new floor installed. Uh, the new floor was all the way. They took out the floor. They put in, they made us sand and seal the floor. They put down the plastic. They put in new vinyl flooring. But what I need from this board is not to have a repeat of that issue. I need the drainage improved. And you can see in your packet here, here's the man's, you know, sanding the floor. Here's the check to show that I paid for the ceiling. All right, okay, we, we will take a look at the packet. One, one, one thing more, Mark. These two in color show the mold and mildew and the water on the plant. 
it's, it's pretty hard to refute. These pictures show the mold and water on the planks. So I, I really beg you, we can't go through that nightmare again. I need the board to help me improve the, the drainage in my property. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker is Peggy Kahn. Hello, my name is Peggy Kahn. I've owned a home here since January 2018, and prior to this, I have had not one complaint about Laguna Woods Village. It's beautiful here. You've heard me from me through email, so you know I'm strongly opposed to the LED stop signs, whether they have flashing or stationary lights. It's breaking my heart to see these LEDs being installed. It's ruined the quiet enjoyment of my home because I have glaring lights visible from every window 24 seven. It's spoiling the many walks I take, makes the village feel like we have multiple emergencies outside, especially at night when the glare is the worst. I was originally told the LEDs are for the safety of sight and hearing impaired pedestrians, which I sympathize with. But in over 50 years, there are no reports indicating a problem with pedestrian accidents related to ignored stop signs. If this information exists, I again ask the board, any board, to please provide it. I was also told these are to get people to fully stop at an intersection. But I have 21 videos so far to prove these LEDs have no effect on rolling stoppers. The lack of accidents alone prove that people do stop fully for pedestrians and cross traffic. It seems like hundreds and thousands of dollars are being spent in a pointless attempt to control drivers and to avoid imaginary accidents. Please think about the fact that prior to these LEDs, our master plan community had not one traffic signal within the residential interior, only at exits onto main boulevards. This is destroying a half a century's peaceful environment with one offensive light polluting project. This type of flashing sign wouldn't be allowed in a shopping center or an industrial park anywhere around this area. HOA rules wouldn't allow a resident to have lights like this on their home. So why is the board breaking its own rules? Please consider how dangerous these LEDs are to our community. The LEDs are harmful to the wildlife nesting in trees and to night flying birds such as owls. The LED intensity is blinding to residents walking toward a sign during low light, like sunrise or sunset. Flashing lights can cause seizures for people suffering from conditions such as Parkinson's and epilepsy. Many unit sales will lose value as a nuisance like these must be disclosed if seen from a home. I'm sure the board had no idea how bright these industrial grade lights would be, but now that they do. I'm sure the board thought this would make people come to a complete stop, but it doesn't. This project needs to be canceled and reversed before it does more harm. You, can, you can't get control of all the people all the time, but you can get people's attention by creating pedestrian crosswalks with proper striping and non-lit signage. I have a sample of some good I've managed properties, commercial properties, for 47 years. I've had my own company since 1999. Thank, thank I thank have a sample of pedestrian walkways that are extremely effective. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peggy. Next speaker is Bill Fisher. That's my name. <laughs> I'm at uh, 5541B. He's, he's at B and I'm at A. Uh, first, I want to thank the board. Uh, I know it's a challenge for you guys to keep track of everything you hear about and deal with it. So I'm here to talk about two things in three minutes, believe it or not. First and most important, I'm here to uh, support Larry. Uh, he's suffered damage to his flooring from water intrusion. Uh, at least part of the problem is groundwater, if not all of it. 
and it's due to lack of maintenance by VMS. Uh, over the past 40 years, turf and tree root buildup has blocked dra surface drainage around our condo and the neighboring condos. When I moved here in 2015, it was an obvious problem to me. Why? Because I'm a civil engineer and that's one of my specialties. Uh, in 2016, I requested that the drainage be improved around my manor and nothing was ever done. Uh, Mr. Engdahl uh, came out and looked at it and I thank him for doing that. Uh, we need our surface drainage improved, please. Second item, right now the VMS and the GRF are planning to raise room rental rates for clubs by four to five hundred percent up to. And to do this, they apparently have abandoned the old cost calculation method and have chosen to put in place a new one and ignore the past 60 years of how things are being calculated for the costs of rooms. This isn't right. Uh, they have a new calculation method. They're changing the rules. They do it for undisclosed reasons, at least so much as I can find in looking at the documentation. If you're going to change the rules, change them for everybody. Make everybody unhappy. Okay, don't target a, a group that's easy to target. At the same time, it looks like certain programs have no cost increases, like Clubhouse 4, they get free rooms, free facilities, so on and so forth. Other groups get excessive subsidies. The equestrian center has 28 horses. There's a net cost of 432000 That's $15,500 each per year, every year, for each of these people. We probably have, with their $3,000 that they contribute, one of the most expensive equestrian centers in Orange County. We also subsidize five non-residents to the tune of $15,000 each. They can't be asked to leave. It's in the rules. This is just wrong. There's so many ways to find money to pay for the bills. Don't target groups that are easy to target. Don't let groups off for no charge. Don't subsidize people $15,000 a year because they're special and they have people on the GRF possibly that have horses and protect their own. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Next speaker is David Gorelitz. The item has been removed, so I will not be speaking. Okay, thank you. And we have one resident who emailed in. It's from uh, Chris Collins, and she stated the following. This is an update on the work that the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village does on behalf of residents experiencing temporary financial emergency. The foundation raises monies used to assist residents, a special kind of hero. I never had the chance to meet this man, but he is a special kind of hero. I only learned about him when the foundation was recently served with legal papers. When he passed away at age 97, he lived alone, his wife had died, and he had no children. However, he had an extensive military career as a pilot during World War II and the Korean War. He had lived in Laguna Woods Village for many years and owned his manor outright. As a result, he had an estate but no ready heirs. Yet over the years, he had benefited from the assistance of social services and the foundation of Laguna Woods Village. As a result, he decided to leave his estate, essentially, essentially his manor, to the foundation. In that way, he will be able to help residents who might need help in the months or years ahead in the same way he had been helped in the past. You too can change and protect the lives of village residents for years to come with the actions you take today. Having a will or trust is an essential part of your family's future and your philanthropic legacy. Without having a will or trust, the courts will determine how your estate is distributed. A gift to the foundation of Laguna Woods Village by will or trust is easy to arrange and a gift can be a specific dollar, property, or an asset, or it can be a percentage of your overall estate. If you already have a will or trust, you can easily add a provision designating a gift to the foundation with a simple addendum. Your estate lawyer, accountant, or financial advisor can help with arranging such a gift. For more information, you can also contact the foundation at 949-268-2246 or foundation at comline.com. 
For more information about the foundation, please go to our website at foundationoflagunawoodsvillage.org. Please note that the donations can always be made using PayPal on the foundation website. And that is all for open forum. Okay, thank you, Michaela. All right, anybody on the board have any responses to any of the speakers? All right, oh, Jules. I have two comments, but they don't involve the speakers. They involve the speakees. Uh, I want to call out Mark specifically for his very tender or kind handling of the time limits. Uh, previously, we have had uh, people saying your time limit is up and stop it, and it becomes almost argumentative. Allowing someone an extra 30 seconds or a minute or two makes gives a completely different impression about how we feel about our members and our relationship to them. Uh, that's the first thing. Secondly, I'd like to thank Michaela for taking her time to read Chris Collins's uh, 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 message. The point is that uh, there's a big difference between reading a message the way it's meant to be, the way it's written, and someone speed reading it, which again tells our members what we think of them. So I really want to thank Mark and Michaela. Here, here. Right. Thank you, Jules. Um, all right, just uh, I'll, I'll comment. Uh, I'm sorry, Moon, and maybe Ira as well, sir. Oh, for the speaker, for the drainage problem, I got involved in the one of my friend almost a similar problems. It took a lot of uh, wrangling to solve it. There is a drainage problem. He had the same problem as you had, okay? And in community, especially when we have a lot of raining, like this year or some other year, there is a drainage problem. I think it needed to be looking at whole community we have to evaluate the whole drainage problems. And they will eliminate or minimize some of the costly waste expense. Second one is, as you said, about the room rate. We are in negative at some point. And so even at our board, and who is not here, you know, Kush is, Last time when we had a board meeting, Kushi had about uh, 10 ways we can raise money. So we are concerned about uh, expense and we are concerned about uh, how we're going to minimize all the negative. But either we either have to use the user's fee, raise it, or otherwise we have to increase the whole HOA fee, or as you said, we have to do some generalized whole overall overhaul of our fee expense. And that is well spoken. Thank you. Thank you, Moon. Ira, were you going to say something? Uh, might I ask uh, Larry one question? You may. Okay. Larry, um, you mentioned the law changed. Do you know what year that the change for the underlayment? On the uh, around the 2020, they decided. At the mic, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> around 2020, I think I wasn't the only person having these issues, and so they realized they have to put this three mil plastic before they put down. The right, I, I was just more concerned with the date it went into effect. Uh, uh, around 2020. Okay. Because when we were 2018, when we started having these issues, uh, that wasn't the requirement. So around 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All right, so, so I'll um, kind of address them also. So Mr. Halpern, Mr. Fisher, regarding the drainage issues, I know that staff is working on it. I've been talking with them. I know uh, Director Engel is as well. Um, so we will continue to work to help ensure that this doesn't happen to you again, as you're uh, re requesting, as well as um, you know, look into, as, as Moon suggests, you know, if, if um, some of the, the drainage things are, have gotten clogged over time. Make sure that we have a program that uh, helps 
unclog those or looks at them on a regular basis to make sure that they're unclogged. So we're working that. Um, regarding the flashing lights, um, you know, there's there's uh, all sorts of opinions on those, but you know, third board doesn't have a whole lot to do with that. Um, you know, the decision was made by GRF. So Ms. Khan, if you could take your concerns to GRF, that'd be great. And I know, I know you are, um, since I do, do read your emails. Um, and Mr. Fisher, same with the room rental rates. Um, you know, while some on the board are participatory of some of that, um, there was a, uh, a committee meeting uh, earlier this month that I'm on where we, we voted that down, the room rental rates as um, proposed, so it, the work is continuing on it, but that's also ultimately a GRF issue. So um, while we'll listen, there's not a ton that we here on the third board can do. Are you on the Community Activities Committee? I am. Well, I sure hope that changes the way they do business. Okay, fair, fair enough, okay. And then, um, um, as always, Ms. Collins, thank you for your updates on the uh, Laguna Woods Foundation. They're always uh, pleasant to, to hear. Yeah, so thanks. It looks like Mr. Cook, Dr. Director Jim has a, a comment. Yeah, and along with that, with it being GRF issues, we have limited ability to change or direct GRF. We only have one appointee to the GRF board, and he is very fiscally minded. Uh, as far as the flashing lights and that comes from in and C from the GRF, I'm on that committee, but again, limited input. And so you have to understand, we like hearing from you, but they're GRF issues. You really need to pound on them more. The only control we have over GRF is really when the spending comes above $500,000. And that was only enacted a few years back. So before, GRF was basically completely independent. And so we're limited in how much influence we have on GRF decisions other than the committees that we serve on where we try and use some influence. So, it, so you know the, the structure. And, and I'll get to you in just a second, Jules. Um, it's also noted that the boards, uh, um, United, um, Third, the Towers, which is, which is Mutual 50, we ultimately select the GRF board members, but um, in the case of the last election, nobody ran. So um, the, the people that um, uh, were on the board re-ran themselves and they were then chosen to be on the board. So there was no opportunity for um, board members to even try to choose anybody else had they wanted to do so. So if you're concerned about GRF, Please, uh, they're, they're having some elections in the October, November time frame as well. Please consider running for the GRF board. Jules, did you have a comment or question? Yes, I did. Uh, hold the champagne. Uh, we may have celebrated too early the uh, uh, CAC meeting that turned down the, uh, uh, that outrageous uh, increase in room rates because like a, the living dead, apparently it's coming back tomorrow at the GRF Finance Committee. So if you want to have some fun, show up tomorrow at the GRF Finance Committee where they're going to raise the question again. Okay, Jim. And I might also add, like the CAC, they may give a recommendation to the GRF board, but the GRF board does not have to follow CAC's recommendation. So keep that in mind also. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 all right, enough of the uh, GRF. Now we're now on agenda item nine. Um, to each of our monthly board members, um, excuse me, board meetings this year, we've been adding a department update segment where one of our leaders of VMS gives a short presentation about their organization to help communicate with our members who the leaders are, along with the key activities being worked by VMS. Joining us today is Chief Eric Nunez, who's going to tell us a little bit about the security service organization which he manages. Chief, good morning. Thank you, President Laws, and, and thank you uh, to the entire board. Um, first off, uh, I, I just want to make one comment about the flashing stop signs, because um, having had a daughter with epilepsy, that was a, a concern, I think, with the flashing. So I'm researching. I was told that it didn't flash. Um, 
but, uh, a flash less than five to 30 hertz per uh, second, which is where it usually triggers them. So I'll, I'll make that uh, inquiry. Uh, and we do have a way to dial down the flashing if that's, that's an issue. But I, I think it's a lot slower than that. So, um, so that is, I'm glad you brought up that concern and I'll certainly look into that right away. Thanks. Um, but uh, on with the presentation, uh, you know that security services, the big umbrella, covers not only uh, what we call Work Center 400, which is security, but it's also uh, social services 220 and, um, and our compliance uh, Work Center, which is 210. Um, I won't go into a lot with them other than tell you probably what you already know that we have our manager uh, out uh, and has left for our social services. Um, Susan McInerney, uh, and so uh, we're actively recruiting for that position right now. We've uh, conducted an interview last Friday, and we have a couple more this next week, and uh, then we should be making that selection shortly. Um, so we'll move on to 400. Uh, what do you see before you is uh, just kind of a quick uh, snapshot of our uh, recruit personnel recruiting personnel vacancies, and we have uh, one supervisor, we're down, six security um, patrol officers down, um, three full-time dispatchers, and uh, what we managed to do, this is the bright note of that, is that we've got uh, a gentleman named Ed Green, who's a, who lives here in the community, uh, member resident, and uh, he has, um, he's working part-time as our uh, disaster preparedness a coordinator. He's a part-time uh, employee there, and uh, and he's really helped. Just real quickly, his background is that he used to be the emergency manager for um, Long Beach Harbor, so he's used to doing and knows this work and has worked with a very large, uh, obviously robust uh, amount of personnel and budget to do the kind of work that they have to do at the Long Beach Harbor. So we're happy to have him on board. You'll see him in the Disaster Preparedness uh, Task Force office sometimes. And, uh, and he's been doing a lot of coordinator meetings uh, with, the, um, with the clubhouse coordinators, and, uh, and he'll be on Channel 6 probably next month. And then uh, one of the things that we've done at the uh, work center is uh, increased our um, training sessions and, uh, and meetings internally. Uh, I hold a supervisor designed the first three on that list that you see that are bulleted or something that I started doing when I got here, but holding a supervisor design uh, monthly training, uh, what happens is these, these supervisors that we have, they put together uh, training for their briefings. So every once a month, they, they cover an, an issue. Uh, it could be a service issue, customer service issue, a safety issue, and um, so we ask them to do that. And, and, and some of this gets to be repeated, but it's worth repeating because these are the things that you know, we fall down on and, or need to do better. So we're constantly doing that. We, uh, I've also incorporated these quarterly meetings that I have with supervisors and, and my manager. And, um, and those are meant to, you know, make uh, effective communications so that we, um, that we do a better job as well so that everybody's on the same page. I think recently I was working with um, um, Director or Vice President uh, Cook on an issue that uh, uh, with our gate ambassadors that shows that people aren't working on the same page sometimes. And so that's one of the things that this gate ambassador supervisor position um, who's conducting is now conducting uh, these um, bi-monthly, if you will, meetings and trying to get people because we have about 162 gate ambassadors. That's the actual bench that we pull from, but we, we don't use that many folks. And so you, um, but you need that because people that are sick on vacation, aren't able. So in order to do that, you have to have those uh, that many folks to pull from to fill uh, the amount of um, gates that we have and the hours of operations. So all of these meetings um, combined uh, really increased our, our communications with each other and trying to, uh, for me as a director, signal what, uh, what I would like to see done you know, in each department. And we, I even meet with uh, 220 and 210, their managers on a on a weekly basis uh, every uh, Tuesday so that we can keep each other apprised as to what's going on and what needs to be done. Um, so all of that's um, go ahead and advance it. It's been very helpful. 
Um, so I won't spend time with social services and compliance uh, here right now, but I will talk to you about some of the security or 400 issues. One you're already uh, very well aware of, well, a couple of them, is the uh, relocating of uh, security operations. Uh, and, uh, and, then in, and then with that, we're actually, we have some new technology. It's a new computer-aided uh, dispatch or CAD and, uh, and record management system that's going to enhance uh, dispatch. And, um, and then I wanted to talk about uh, uh, performing gate 12 uh, overview or just an update, essentially, where we're at with that. So next slide. Um, we, reloc we relocated April 8th. Uh, from building E over here to uh, this building over at uh, 24361. And um, uh, so far, you know, so good. We're in, there's a bunch of boxes. We're waiting for furniture. Uh, but I, my, I have to tell you that um, Manuel's team in coordinating this move um, and, with, uh, and with the IT and Chuck uh, and his crew uh, really just did a yeoman's job of, of helping to move a ton of people over at one time, in fact, uh, one of the logistical issues was that we had to create a dispatch, temporary dispatch center and work center for on-duty personnel and, uh, and be way before the move, so we knew that it was operational and there wouldn't, wouldn't be any interruption of services to the community because we're a 24-7 operation, and they did that wonderfully, and uh, we currently have our dispatch and, and, uh, and our uh, couple officers and the watch commander working up on the third floor temporarily until um, the furniture arrives and all the new uh, technology has been tested and working operational and then we'll uh, we'll should have them in probably by the end of this month or the first week of may and then we can uh, set up um, there they'll be back into the same workplace that we are so that'll be great so uh, that new cad or computer aided dispatch system uh, and record management system is something that We've had for a little while now that was purchased off a couple of budget cycles ago, uh, but we're having trouble implementing it with the, uh, some of the server issues and technology. When we moved over here, those things kind of went away and it was the right time to actually uh, implement this uh, uh, new technology. And the reason why I'm looking forward to it um, as a director is that it's going to be able to more easily um, mine the information that's in there so that I can hopefully pull out uh, better reports uh, to you on in terms of the data because we all know you know garbage in garbage out if you don't have a way to actually uh, stat these things appropriately so that they're flagged appropriately and then when you go to search them you can find uh, find it easily well the system we had wasn't built that way and a lot of the uh, in fact uh, President Laws you had talked to me about trying to get stats and some of these stats aren't they're not broken down to mutual they're not entered that way so you the only way you could ever find that out is go for each call and, and then go in there and look at the address and then start doing it by hand. So if you have 30,000 calls for service, you can imagine how long it would take to figure out, you know, by hand, you know, what mutual had what um, uh, uh, incidents that they were reporting most. But as I say in here on, on this sheet, you can see that uh, it'll be better for us to track time um, for our response time. It'll be uh, easier to um, be able to tell who our heavy users are. Um, not, I mean, we kind of know a little bit in terms of uh, certain areas of the community, and that's mostly just because they're the largest sector of the community. But we'll be able to tell what you know the nature of the calls for services are, and uh, and and working with that new ERP solution, um, it sounds like it'll be integrated with that, and that's going to be wonderful for everybody that needs to access that information, and maybe perhaps create a dashboard that make it really entirely easier for staff and everybody else and the okay um and then gate 12. um <clears throat> what has happened with gate 12 is we've ordered it's on its way for a kiosk uh for which is the same setup that is at every other gatehouse uh didn't have it uh, uh, originally because it was uh, decided that at that time that it was going to be managed differently because it didn't lead in directly into residential uh, properties, obviously indirectly through cart paths and stuff you could get there, but, um, but it didn't uh, have any direct routes, so they were managing 12, gate 12 differently. But um, in order to do the things that uh, 
you know, that we'd like to do. And, and, and once again, I'm, you know, this discussion I had with um, Vice President Cook was about QR readers, one of those things. And so it doesn't, you can't have a handheld QR reader if there's nothing it connects to because they're using what they call an app out there. So if you put in the kiosk, then you can have a QR reader just like every other gatehouse does, and it can read the visitor pass uh, rather quickly and, and less than the time that it's going to take for people to go through that line uh, and be in queue. Um, uh, the other thing that we were looking at, or th we did, and we st will, we are still doing, is having a security personnel going through the uh, extra patrol checks on the heavier traffic time, because that way, having that car there and seeing somebody out there with the gate uh, gate ambassadors um, slows people down, and we're thankful that they slow down because sometimes people will just drive right back past there if they're stepping out, and we don't want anything bad to happen to them, obviously. Um, so that's one of the things that um, we've done. We've noticed that um, that the overall the, the complaints at it have just been uh, reduced to almost nothing. You know, in terms of, and really, it got to a point where most of the complaints were coming from the gatehouse ambassadors themselves. And you can imagine it's a stressful job. You know, just like all of the other gatehouses, uh, we have about uh, eight million vehicles passing through. Um, a year through all all of our gates, and so um, this is a very busy area. And uh, granted, some of those are service vehicles and security vehicles, but it's still they still have to come through these gate systems. And so they're they're um, it's a busy community. Uh, when they say active community, we are an active community. And we have a lot of visitors to our community. Um, and then uh, and then we were looking at other options like the RFID. Um, uh, system and, uh, and also looking at um, and whether or not you know we should be putting uh, a formal two-lane um, traffic in that area. So uh, that would be work that we have to do with the MNC and and uh, looking at that. And then obviously um, uh, Robert Carroll's unit would be the one they have to actually paint that uh, line in the street. So um, and then um, President Laws was asking if I could talk. Or speak about a little bit about um, our licensure and some of the restrictions and what we do versus what the sheriffs do. So, uh, just so you know that we are what they call from the uh, BSIS of the state of California that regulates uh, security, um, and uh, they uh, we are called a private uh, proprietary private security employer. Uh, that's the licensure in which we uh, operate the PSC and. Um, in with a PSC, they can't be armed. They don't have um, uh, firearms. They don't have uh, impact weapons like batons. They don't have pepper spray. Uh, they actually don't have it. I mean, they're like you, essentially sitting in those chairs. They have that's the weapons that they have is just themselves. Um, so, um, so in terms of um, what they can do, go ahead. And, next slide, Donald. Um, patrol officers uh, that we have out here, what we have instructed them to do since um, we've changed our licensure is their primary uh, directive is to observe and report, you know, and, and in most cases um, they do exactly that. There are times when they intervene and will detain people. Obviously people get citations, uh, notices of violations they uh, refer to them as. Uh, for vehicle issues, uh, traffic issues, um, and so you'll see that. But um, in terms of the crimes, they're not supposed to uh, enforce any of those types of laws if they if they observe a crime being committed, or or they're being made aware that a crime has been committed by a resident. Uh, they will take a report, but they will an incident report, but they will. Um, will either immediately contact the sheriffs via our dispatch, and our dispatch just simply dials 911 and tells them we need them out there, or they'll, um, they'll tell the resident if it's a cold type of report where they had a theft that happened last week when they're on vacation, they'll tell me what you need to do is follow up with the sheriff's department, make a report so that they're aware of this, so if there's a trend happening, they're aware that there's a crime trend, otherwise they don't know if it's not reported. Um, and... Um, uh, but with any critical uh, incident um, or any incident involving some sort of violence, uh, it's, it, you know, 
like anybody else, they, they have the power to do a citizen's arrest. And if you think about it, like our, um, our folks that are uh, trespassing, um, what they typically do is they contact them to, and, and, our, and our rules, our governing docs say they can actually ask them what they're doing here and, 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 and ask them if they are, you know, and ask for proper um, identification and uh, if they believe them to be trespassing or, or if they look suspicious for whatever reason they've been notified about them. And so that person has to comply or they'll ask them to leave the property. If they refuse to, they have to give an admonishment. And then after that admonishment and they refuse to, then they can actually do a citizen's arrest, contact the sheriff's department, and the sheriffs can either do a couple things. They can escort them off the property and release them. They can um, escort them off the property and then cite, give them a citation. Or they can escort them off the property and escort them all the way to county jail and book them. Uh, for the misdemeanor, um, so they do. We do have the re, um, the responsibility to protect, you know, the lives and property here. But what we try to inform them is to observe and report anything like that for for us. And then, but they will intervene um, just because of the nature of who they are and what they do, so that someone um, um, hopefully doesn't get hurt if they see some situation and try to perform a citizen's arrest on somebody until the sheriffs can actually come and handle that criminal um, allegation or, or what we suspect is a crime. And that's it. Great. Thank you, Chief. Um, any questions or comments by directors? Jim, go ahead. Uh, just wondered if you might be able to supply us, and if the board agrees, with what the traffic violation charges are on the outside world compared to what we charge here because I think rather than flashing stop signs it might discourage people from running stop signs and driving too fast if the uh, cost to them was more equivalent to what it is if they get a regular citation on the outside. Well thank you for that yeah we're actually looking into that and especially um, not just only for the first offense but that we have people that commit the same offense over and uh, and there's uh, there's a couple of those violations where it doesn't actually increase it stays the same so that I don't you know if they can afford to to run a stop sign or speed you know they're just gonna it doesn't really encourage them not to you know so okay great great and just a reminder that would be GRF's under GRF's domain but yeah, right you <laughs> would have the information moon and I see your hand up Kush so I'll get to you in a minute Go ahead, thank moon. you when residents were threatened or they see that they need to call 911 sheriff department immediately or go to resident or security when you said that security our security service does not have a lot of power then instead of wasting time is that better to call the sheriff's department immediately yeah, I think any time that it's a life-threatening situation, um, you should be calling the sheriff's department. Like, we, we know how to give CPR, first aid, and we have AEDs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if somebody is, you know, is having a medical emergency, then you want to call the paramedics or the fire department first. We're still going to respond. And a lot of times we'll actually get there first because we're, because we're in the, on the property driving around. And there's nothing wrong with that getting there because, you know, we may be able to intervene and, and try to, you know, help at that point. Um, but you're right. I mean, if you really feel like your life is being threatened, it's a crime. And that crime is going to be investigated um, by the Orange County Sheriff's Department. And um, so they would probably be the ones you'd want to call. And then there's no, and a lot of times they will notify us that they're responding to uh, the property for whatever the reason is so that we are made aware of it. And then uh, we will follow up with that too. Andy? Thank you for all the information. I had a question about our relationship with the uh, city of Laguna Woods. Does Laguna Woods City have any sworn police officers? They do a contract with uh, Orange County Sheriff's Department. Oh, okay. Um, when I last talked to um, our, our chief of services for Orange County Sheriff's Department, which is Captain um, Alday, Cruz Alday, 
he was uh, telling me that they actually have a, a dedicated uh, officer um, that's been on the property driving around and uh, where before, you know, a lot of times they would have him in the area supporting Laguna Nigel and all the other cities as well. Uh, but it sounds like we have uh, one uh, deputy that's actually a, a unit, patrol unit, that's, that's dedicated to stay within the confines of Laguna. Okay, so depending on the time, it, that could be pretty quick response if the it sheriff's deputy is around. But maybe in the off hours, that's a problem. The sheriff's, the sheriff's deputy would have to come from further away. Yeah, I, you know, and I want to speak on, on their deployment, but I will tell you that um, uh, some of the times, yeah, there, there could be a delay, uh, but they're pretty good about responding um, anywhere within Laguna Woods, actually. But they understand our demographics, and, and, uh, and they understand uh, you know, the seriousness of when we call them, because they know that we handle as a security Team, we handle a lot of things that they would they at another city would be getting calls for these calls all the time but we actually pick up on a lot of those calls for them and only uh, ask for their help when we really need it but if you dial 911 you're going to get a dial you're going to get a 911 dispatcher on that radio on that phone call I mean okay thank you okay. all right Kush did you have a comment or question uh, yes I had a question <coughs> um, and this may have been considered, I'm trying to talk about uh, gate 12. Um, gate 12 is uh, experiencing a different, I mean, residents are experiencing a different kind of thing. They have to show their resident IDs. Is it possible to put some temporary sticker on the cars of the resident that they don't have to fish their cards out of their wallet? Because many people may not be ready to do that, and that creates a delay, and it flows onto the street. So this may have been thought of. I'm not really aware of it. But some kind of a temporary sticker on the cars, is that something you guys have thought of? We, uh, uh, Director Bahad, we actually um, moved away from the stickering program that we had previously. Uh, I, I will tell you that... Um, when I looked at it, it was um, somewhere in the $30,000 a year range to um, administer that program. And it's not just a cost thing, but um, one of the things I know is that we've advertised and have notified residents about Gate 12 um, uh, at least a half a dozen times now in the last, you know, uh, three months and four months. And, uh, and so, um, and we had a large group at the SEAC uh, meeting uh, here um, when we talk, we discussed it. I think uh, the reason why we're seeing the complaints, you know, kind of go by the wayside is because everybody is now, and especially you got a lot of regulars that go to the golf course and, and, the, and pickleball and such, and so they're already aware that they're going to ask, be asked for ID just like they would be at uh, any other gate if they didn't have uh, RFID uh, working or didn't have RFID. And so I, I don't think it's a, uh, that issue is as big of an issue as it is. Um, we still want to try to effectively move people in uh, as efficiently, efficiently, efficiently as possible. So what we're, uh, that's why we're looking at putting in the kiosks so um, uh, those handheld uh, visitor scanners can expedite that without them having to input anything. And then, and then the uh, cameras that we have there will instantly uh, put their plates in. But... Um, yeah, we. Um, uh, I, I I don't want to go backwards into the sticker uh, pro, um, uh, issue, uh, but uh, I understand why that seems like a simple solution. Uh, that's correct. I know what you're doing is right. How long before the kiosk and all this is completed? The uh, kiosk, based on uh, what they have uh, told us. Um, the vendor is that it should be in by the uh, well it should be arrived uh, by the end of the month or the first of next month and then um, I'm told um, by uh, Chuck Holland that uh, it will only take them you know data uh, imp uh, get that thing um, installed and then run some tests to make sure it's operating properly um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that within about three weeks that that'll be a done deal 
So I'm estimating latest by end of June, you should be all functional. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, okay. That's good. Thank oh, you. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Kush. Any others? Oh, Jim. Yeah, in this case, I'm an old dog, and old dogs can learn new tricks. And I frequent gate 12 quite often, and I see the line in front of me, and everybody's got their ID up by the window, and we're just going smoothly through. So once, once everybody kind of gets educated, it seems like it's really flowing really well now. Thank you for that, sir. And I had just a couple questions. Um, on slide six, you mentioned a CAD system and an RMS system. Mm -hmm. You define CAD as computer aid to dispatch. RMS is what report I'm management. I'm sorry. It's, yeah, it's a rec re uh, record management. Record management. System. Okay, got it. So all that data that comes when they okay. input it. Okay. I know you talked about keeping yeah. track of things, so I wasn't sure if it was what that was. Um, security patrol officers. How many total positions are there? I know you said you have six opens. How many? Well, with security patrol, we have uh, fourteen uh, allocated positions. We have uh, three traffic positions, and then we have nine supervisor positions that are in the field, um, and then uh, so nine, uh, nine plus 14, 14, 20, yeah. Okay. And so, um, uh, but in terms of just the SPOs, security patrol officers, when you have six missing from the, uh, from, you know, the, the gross of nine, that's, that's a significant hit. Yeah. Okay, and the nine supervisory that are in the field perform the same they, they do the same they handle calls for service okay. as well as supervised okay. uh, field uh, personnel they just may not give tick traffic tickets uh yeah they don't okay. typically so, give so you have three, three that are designated for traffic. for the entire village correct that's correct okay just kind of want to share that make sure everybody understands that just if they're wondering why people aren't getting tickets because we don't have yeah. enough people to give them yeah, perhaps and, and i'm glad you brought that up because whenever we go short those folks working traffic sometimes have to cover those open shifts, okay. and, and so you'll see less uh, traffic enforcement as a result. Okay, okay, good, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Nope, oh, Moon has another question. Sorry, I didn't see your hand up. Sorry, <laughs> my hand is always <laughs> low. Do we have any system like a resident can volunteer to patrol? Uh, no, you we know, do some not. other community or some of you know, had, they do have a resident patrol assisted the, uh, you know, the police officers and all that. But do we have a, that kind of system here? No, we don't have. Uh, what I think what you're referring to is like a neighborhood watch program, where the, those are usually uh, incorporated programs that work um, in w along with, say, law enforcement, but they're not a part of the police department. And uh, that would probably be how it would work in the same thing because they're, in a, they're their own entity. Um, but, um, but I like the idea. I mean, it's, you know, it's one to consider. Yeah, to save us some money. I well, guess. I think it's just more eyes, right? And being yeah. able to report that whole see something, say something. Now you have people that are designated to kind of yeah. look and do that. Okay. Good, good. good. Right. Thanks again, Chief. I right. appreciate it. SK, man. Yes, uh, the, the question place. at gate 12, what kind of system you are planning to, to have? I'm not quite clear which, what kind of system you have. It's it, it'll be the same system that we have at every other gatehouse. It, it was designed when it first was designed. Okay. Um, because, as I said, it didn't enter into residentials, that it would be managed different. Okay. And then where's so, the money coming from? I'm sorry? Where's money coming from? Uh, the money is uh, uh, for the system. Uh, well, the system itself is like uh, twenty five hundred dollars for us to purchase. So it was coming from um, oh twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah. Oh, the bars for the kiosk. Uh, not uh, not for yeah, no. yeah. I think there's, we're not. Yeah. We, yeah. I'm yeah, sorry. I was just gonna say when yeah. you say the same as every yeah. other gate. Yeah. It's a bit confusing. Yeah. What I meant was um, this. What I meant is the uh, the technology piece that we're using. It doesn't have gate arms. Uh, we don't have any plans for it to put gate arms because the gate arms are actually, if you look at the ramp up at the queue or where okay, it's at right yes. now, it would not uh, be appropriate. Um, it would have to be a whole completely redesign of that, which would be probably yeah, that's extremely what I thought. expensive. Yeah, we're not looking to do that. Uh, we're looking to use what's in place right now and then, and then incorporate some of the technology within the gatehouse so that uh, it makes it easier for them to just oh, okay. allow people to come in. Okay. Thank you. Okay.
Okay, now I'm going to look look around even better, I see. <laughs> All right. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Appreciate the, good day. the discussion and presentation. All right, moving on to agenda item 10, which is the CEO report. Siobhan? Thank you, Honorable President. Members of the board, I did want to mention before we skip Eric's topic, uh, we do have some residents who serve as part-time security patrol officers. They're not volunteers, they're actual employees, but I did want to mention that. Um, this morning I wanted to go over some simple ways residents can stay informed. Often when we go to meetings and so forth, we hear that residents may not have known about something. So I just wanted to touch on quick ways that residents can stay in tune with what's going on in the village. The easiest way is to subscribe to What's Up in the Village. This is an email that's sent every Friday to more than 17,000 recipients. Residents may subscribe by going to lagunawoodsvillage.com and clicking on the Contact Us icon in the top right-hand corner. This is circled in red on your screen. The next thing to do is to scroll to the bottom and complete all fields, requesting a subscription to Village Emails and Alerts. Residents may also subscribe to board email updates. As you know, the third board sends regular email ups, updates targeted specifically to their housing mutual members. To subscribe specifically to these messages, use the same website form that I showed on the previous slide or send a message to info at vmsinc.org. I do want to remind residents that simply having your address on file with resident services does not, does not subscribe you to the weekly email blast. You must opt in, so you must subscribe. So please do that if you're interested in receiving the email blast every Friday and your mutual's regular newsletter. Also, you may check the village website for the latest news. This is available at lagunawoodsvillage.com. If you click on the news tab and news home, these are the latest news updates for the village. There are also regular news updates posted on the Village Facebook page. If you're a social media user, this is another good way to obtain regular information. Board and committee meetings, as you know, third meets the third thir Tuesday of every month, as do the other boards. GRF meets the first and United the second Tuesday of each month at 9.30 a.m. You may view the board and committee meeting schedule at lagunawoodsvillage.com by selecting the calendars tab and going to the all governance boards calendar. To attend meetings via Zoom, you may go to the same page, which is lagunawoodsvillage.com, calendars, all governance boards, and click on the link a few minutes prior to the meeting to launch Zoom. No password or registration is required. Another way to watch board and committee meetings is using lagunawoodsvillage.com meetings, which shows all committee and board meetings via Granicus. This is our system. Meetings are listed by date with the most recent at the top. You may click the video to watch the meetings and view the agenda documents, or click agenda to see the documents and all backup materials. Of course, all board meetings are broadcast live on TV6. They're also replayed on TV6 the following Thursday at 1.30 p.m., as well as the following week on Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m. Meeting recordings are available on the Village YouTube channel. To access the Village YouTube channel, you go to the website homepage and click on the red arrow as shown on the screen before you. We also encourage residents to subscribe to Code Red the Village Emergency Notification System, which we use intermittently if there are pressing matters that have to be communicated widely to the village. And this is found on the home screen, I'm sorry, the home page of the website again. It's circled on red in the upper left-hand corner of the home page. Residents need to scroll to the bottom to subscribe to Code Red, open the drop-down menu, and click on Code Red and complete all fields. And you can also complete a form at the concierge desk that looks like the one on the screen before you in the lobby of the community center if you prefer to do this in person. And last month I talked about ways residents can help control costs. One item I highlighted pertains to the opting out of paper mailings. 
As you are aware, the Davis-Sterling Act requires that each member receives two annual documents, the first being the annual business plan budget that is mailed in late fall. The second is the copy of the results of the annual audit that is mailed in late April. The cost of these two mailings is approximately $7.50 per member. If a third of our membership opted out of receiving these mailings, we would save about $31,000 annually. Last month I used the number of if 12,000 members opted out, this would equate to $90,000 in annual savings. Senate Bill 392, which took effect this year, requires that each member receive a written request to indicate a preferred method of delivery. I know that seems ironic, we're trying to go electronic, but yet the law requires us to mail something to each member. This notice will be arriving later this month along with the results of the annual audit. Please watch for it and reply, especially if you're interested in going electronically. Another way to acknowledge your desire to receive documents electronically is sending an email to information at VMS inc.org and of course we encourage as many residents as possible to go electronic and help us reduce our costs which then are passed along to our members and with that that concludes my update this morning thank you great thank you um look, look like ira has a comment or question um, uh, slide six. sorry uh, on slide six you talked about having to opt in for the rest of the world basically uses the checkbox to opt out. And um, I would like to suggest that on new purchasers, people new into the community, that they need to opt out rather than opt in. And it would just make life simpler. That sounds like an excellent suggestion. I don't know if we can do that now or if we need to wait for the new website, but I will pursue it. Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments, questions? And look around. Okay. All right. Thank you, Siobhan. Appreciate that update. Um, I like the new format. Um, last month it was how we can save money. This month it was how we can stay informed. So appreciate that for uh, all of our members. Thanks. Now we're moving on to agenda item 11, which is our consent calendar. Our all matters listed under, under the consent calendar are recommended for action by committees and will be enacted by the board by a single motion. Today, per the consent calendar, the board is being asked to ratify the preliminary financials for the month of February 2023, approve a lien, approve several landscape committee decisions, approve several architectural control and standards committee variance request decisions, and approve a supplemental appropriation from our existing reserve funds to help cover the cost of emergency roof repairs as a result of the excessive amount of rain that we've had so far this year. So again, these are all decisions that the committees have already made and approved. Um, so can I get a motion to approve today's consent calendar? I see Ira moves, Jim seconds. Uh, we'll look to the right next time, Donna. Um, any questions, comments from members of the board? Okay, any questions from any members or third members? Okay, any objections to approving the consent calendar? Okay, seeing none, we'll consider the consent calendar approved by consent. Thank you. Now on to agenda item 12, unfinished business. 12 item, agenda item 12A is for the board to entertain a motion to approve updates to thirds alteration fee schedule. These updates were suggested by the Architectural Controls and Standards Committee and are specific to the fees for member solar panel applications, as well as updates to the alteration fee schedule chart to remove references to city permit requirements as well as, as per request from the city. Last month, this board approved these changes for 28-day member review and comment. So today we'll be voting as to whether or not to approve these changes for implementation. First, I'd uh, request Chris read the resolution for us. Yes, alteration fee schedule, whereas alteration and variance requests require significant staff time for pr proper processing, including research, report preparation, presentation to the appropriate committee and board, and whereas in order to offset a portion 
of the administrative costs associated with processing alteration and variance applications, including solar installation requests, the board has adopted an alteration fee schedule. And whereas the following revisions to the alteration fee schedule are recommended to be approved by the board. One, the solar installation application application fee is revised to $223. Number two, miscellaneous revisions to address current city requirements. And whereas the new alteration fee schedule better aligns the fees with the administrative time it takes to process each task. Now therefore be it resolved April 18th, 2023, that the board hereby adopts the revised alteration fee schedule as attached to the official minutes of this meeting and resolve further the mutual consent processing fee for solar panel installation is to be calculated based on 4.7 hours charged at the current bill rates and resolve further the mutual consent processing fee for solar panel installation request is set at the initial rate of $223 for 2023 and will be adjusted annually with the adoption of the new bill rates. And resolve further that resolution 03-19-131 adopted December 17, 2019 is hereby superseded and canceled and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the resolution. Thank you. All right. Um, can I get a motion to approve this uh, alteration fee schedule? Donna moves and Jim seconds. Thank you. Uh, any questions, comments from board members? Jim? Has Just one comment. comment. You know, a lot of words, a lot of things. Basically, it's been reduced from $700 to $223 when you're applying for solar. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. We need to make resolutions that simple going forward. <laughs> um, Michaela, are there any uh, member comments on this topic? All right. So it's, now it's time to vote. I think we're going to try to vote electronically. Yeah, all right. Should be on your screen. Okay. Yours is on then, Ralph. So, so um, Ira and Cush, and then Ira can give a thumbs up or down. <laughs> Director Bada, can you provide your, your vote? Uh, I'm sorry, I was not present, so I didn't hear the motion. Can you please tell me? The motion is to approve the alteration application processing fee for solar panels. Yes. Okay, thank you. And Director Lewis? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Even right. So this uh, has passed unanimously. 11 votes yes, no, no, no abstentions. Thank you, board. Um, agenda item 12B, as you recall, at the beginning of the meeting was moved to future agenda items. We're going to move on to agenda item 13. Uh, new business, specifically agenda item 13A, is for the board to entertain a motion to approve the 2023 annual election schedule. As I mentioned earlier, in October of this year, the terms of four third board directors will be ending, and the schedule we're being asked to approve today reflects the key milestones required to meet the election requirements of our bylaws along with their dates. The election process is lengthy, requiring those interested in filling one of these open positions to submit their applications between Monday, June 19th, and Thursday, July 20th, that will allow time for ballots to be printed, mailed, for those ballots to be submitted and counted prior to the annual meeting in early October. Um, I'm not sure if anyone from staff has anything they want to say about this. Um, I, I just want to clarify, Mark, please use the schedule in the agenda item, not the board report for your dates. Okay, so not the staff report, but the attachment one. Yes, please. Okay, okay thank you. All right. 
So there's a couple of minor discrepancies in the staff report. So, okay. Great. Um, can I get a motion to approve the 2023 election schedule? As SK moves. Donna seconds. Thank you both. Uh, anybody have any questions? Okay. All right. Um, I guess uh, any member comments? I didn't think so. Now time to vote. I guess we'll try to vote for this one electronically as well. I really see if it works any better for you. No. <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs oh. down. <laughs> My vote is yes. Thank you, Director Bada. And Director Engdahl? Okay, thank you. Uh, it was approved unanimously. Uh, Ralph and Ira said, Ira said yes. Okay, so we're also, you know. Yeah, but Ira's not there yet, is it? Yeah, no, that's, I said yes on the screen. Yes, yes yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll update it, it yeah, okay, so, so that it reflects. So it's 11, again, unanimous 11, four, zero against, zero abstentions. Thank you, board. Moving on to agenda item 13B, uh, it's for the board to entertain a motion to approve revised architectural standard number 41 for solar panel installations to one story buildings. These updates were suggested by the architectural controls and standards committee and today we'll, we will be voting as to whether or not to submit these revised standard um, uh, components forward for 28 day member review and comment. Does anyone from staff have any opening comments for us regarding this? Thank you, Mr. President and Board. Um, so this is um, one of the first um, standards that we're gonna be reviewing, and the purpose of the review is to streamline the process, to update it, to make sure that it complies with current rules and regulations, and, and to address any uh, deficiencies that the previous standard may have had so with this standard, what we are updating uh, is um, a language that deals with the different types of roofs, the different requirements for the different types of roofs uh, when you install solar panels uh, so that uh, the members and contractors that are putting together their proposals know uh, well in advance what will be the requirements. Uh, what, once um, uh, this standard is approved, the process to um, process these applications Will be, will be greatly reduced to uh, just a few days as, as a uh, mutual, mutual consent only and will not require uh, a variance. Um, in, in addition to that, we provided a, a couple of options and a, and a couple of updates. Uh, one has to do with the uh, uh, the distance, the clear distance that is required uh, between the edge of the uh, solar panel installations and the edge of roofs or, or uh, what is required for proper maintenance of existing features such as skylights and other uh, features that are already on the roof uh, where uh, in the previous standard it was uh, a set uh, distance of three feet. What we have done now is uh, uh, that would be the minimum distance required by uh, by the city or any other regulatory agency with a minimum requirement of 24 inches. Uh, we also provide information uh, regarding uh, the installation of uh, energy storage devices and we left it open so that it allows not only for batteries but for any type of feature type of the technology that may be developed so that we do not have to come back and amend the standard uh, as new technology develops. So um, that concludes my brief introduction of this item. I am available to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bart. Anybody have any questions for Bart? Jim? I'm just looking through. I'm trying to see. We discussed at the ACSC that if a member ended up having to put on the roof and that it was at their cost for the whole roof, that it may be mitigated when additional people put in solar so that they pay back to the original one that paid for the re-roofing of the whole roof. I don't see that in here unless I'm missing it. And that's what we asked to be added at our ACSC meeting on April 10th. 
Director in, in other words, if somebody replaces a whole roof, they put on their solar panels. Now member number two goes to put solar panels on. He didn't have to pay for the re-roofing of the whole roof, that he has to pay a portion of that back to the original one that paid for the whole roof. And Director Cook, you, you are correct. We did discuss that item. Um, that was a misinterpretation on my part uh, as the one that applies to um, uh, the larger buildings. We will need to add that provision, but we don't have the uh, uh, proper language to address that at this time. Okay, thank you. Jules? I just have a question. Uh, <clears throat> uh, given the question that Jim just asked you, someone pays for the whole roof, then somebody else comes in, and they're only one of six people. Do they pay half? Do they pay a sixth? Or do they, as additional people put on solar, do you keep adjusting and rearranging the cost? Has that been considered? I think so. If I might answer, generally when something like this happens, like in Hesperia, gas lines for a property, my uncle put in the gas line across a dozen properties. As each property owner tapped into that gas line, he was only given the portion of that time's dollar amount to be reimbursed. And once all 12, he received a 12th from each of them as time went by. So this would seem to prejudice the first person who has to pay for the whole roof and then the second guy only has to pay for a small portion? But that's, that's the normal way it's done in process because one, one person has to put his foot in the water and then the rest have to follow if they choose to. Yeah. Okay, Ira and then Moon. Uh, well, this is gonna be limited, Jules, because the, if you look at it, um, there's only a few styles of buildings that are shared. Let's say if you have a six pack, there's only three people sharing one roof, uh, not six. Um, because you have three on each side uh, of, of many six packs. So it's, it's not as unwieldy as you think. Um, and most of the, uh, and this is all <coughs> a single story. It's got to do a single story. So a six pack being a two story building would not apply to this at all. Um, and so when you have um, like a duplex, triplex, or a quadplex, generally speaking, there aren't any shared roofs at all. Um, you, because if everybody's on a single level next to each other going outward, um, it would be rare, um, and Bart can confirm this, um, that you'd have a shared roof um, at all. So the, I'm not even sure that um, it would make much difference, but um, it, it, the language needs to be in there just in case we, we have some. I'm just not sure I understand what you mean by a six-pack doesn't apply. I'm in a six-pack, and when we talked about solar, we knew exactly what section of that roof belonged to us. And this has to do with single story, not two story. Oh, <laughs> thank yeah. you. Two, two story or 41A and 41, 41A is two story, 41B is three story. This is just 41 single story. I withdraw my question. Thank you. Good, good question. Good question. Moon, do you have a comment or question? Yeah, I think uh, federal and uh, state are decreasing the reimbursement or whatever. They're encouraging the uh, money, so we got to hurry up on this issue. Second one is uh, same question to Jim. Are they paying the only principal, or does that include any interest? <laughs> It was actually calculated out in my uncle's case where he invested, you know, year one and it took 12 years before he was reimbursed. So it was based on the dollar value. So however much he initially invested, he actually got back more than an initial investment in dollars that didn't buy as much. <laughs> so. Not quite sure I understood that, but okay. Uh, any others? I, I have a few. Um, section 
Um, I'm not really sure what that sentence means. Um, okay, and then, then I'll get to you, Kush. Um, uh, uh, and is there any accommodation for the manor owner to take over the ongoing responsibility of the entire roof if that's above his or her home? So a couple of different scenarios here for um, item 2.4, uh, that is for the installation of a roof system. Uh, if as a result of that installation, additional work needs to be done, uh, that will be at the expense of the member. Now for those few cases, in particular for roofs that have the lightweight concrete uh, tiles where uh, the member will be required to replace the entire roof system, which is what we were talking about, about share cost, and usually for units A and B. Um, so that, that expense will be borne by the member, but um, let me understand your question. So can you repeat the question again? Um, well, I guess the second part of the question, I think you've answered the first part. Is there any accommodation for the manor owner to take over the uh, ongoing responsibility of the roof? Um, you know, within this process, there's language that says if the mutual needs to, say, fix a, go in and fix a leak, that the person who installed the solar is responsible for paying to take all of the solar off right. so that the mutual can come and do whatever they want to do and then they have to pay to put the solar back on. A member may rather choose to take over responsibility of the whole roof and not go through that potential risk. Um, so that's kind of what I'm asking is that in here I'm asking you um, so, and then it sounds like Donna might have a follow-up. Yeah, sure. uh, we were told it, it's that run with the land um, function that once someone puts it in, anyone else buying that unit from them has to maintain okay. everything. Um, and so it just depends. However, if the and, – and Bart, you know, perhaps you can um, help with this. Our understanding, too, though, is that if the roof is still under warranty, then our roofer, our meaning third mutual roofer, puts the actual feet of the solar panels on the roof so that the owner isn't touching the roof. It's only the panels so, above. So that might need some clarification. Let me start with that. So we have three levels of uh, a warranty that we have or uh, cases that we will be looking into. One is for a newly installed roof that's within the five-year warranty that, let's call that one the bumper-to-bumper -bumper warranty, where the contractor uh, will come back and make any repairs uh, during this five-year period. Uh, if there is a solar installation onto one of those roof systems, then yes, the member will be required to have the uh, roofing contractor that, that uh, is providing that warranty to perform, to do those penetrations and seal that, uh, uh, that roof. Those that are within uh, 10 years, which is uh, the period at, uh, uh, when, when they do the, uh, the next inspection. Uh, for that, it is recommended that the roofing contractor be an authorized roofer uh, that uh, can uh, make sure that the warranty will be maintained, uh, and that could be also the same roofer installer that did the roof installation. And then we have the roofs for which those two warranties are, are, uh, have expired, and they're under the material warranty only, and for that uh, type of installation, then the roofing contractor just has to be a uh, licensed contractor uh, that can do the work per industry standards up to uh, the, uh, the end of that material warranty for that specific roof. Uh, in regards to taking over the maintenance of the roof, if there is a planned roof replacement uh, and the uh, member who has installed a uh, solar panel system wishes to take over that portion of the maintenance. We have not considered that, but I can tell you that that will not provide for uh, a full homogeneous roof for the entire roof area. Uh, that, and so we will be dealing with a part of a roof system that is new and a part of a roof system that is an older roof system that could lead to potential uh, uh, leaks into, into the manor and into mutual property. Uh, so we have not looked into that case in detail. Okay, so I, 
I guess I'm thinking of homes like in Gate 11, which are truly standalone homes, um, you know, one roof, one manor. Um, you know, if a person wanted to take over responsibility, that entire roof and, and the solar structure on top of it, is that something that we want to think about? But fair enough, I understand yeah. your response. Um, I'm moving on to my next question. Um, 2.6, you say that the um, structural designs calculations must be, must be wet stamped. What does wet stamped mean? So that, that is an old term that refers to making sure that the plans and specifications and calculations have been reviewed and approved by a licensed engineer. Back in the old days, you actually had a rubber stamp that had ink. Okay. Uh, and nowadays, uh, electronic stamps and signatures are accepted, but the intent is the same, to make sure that those plans are original, that they apply to that specific manner, that specific roof system, and to certify that this additional load that is put onto that roof uh, can be supported by the roof structure underneath. And if, the, if it isn't, it is to provide the proper support system to carry that load. Okay, so it's, it's getting confirmation that you've got the engineer's approval so that if something goes wrong, we know who to go after. And, uh, and it's an original stamp, not a copy. Okay, and, and the reason I brought it up is because I read this resolution after reading the washer dryer resolution where we talk about the engineers um, certifying the pipes and there was nothing talked about wet stamping those. So just bringing that up as you're going through the washer dryer um, standard to re redo it as needed, um, you may want to add wet stamping there. Um, section 2.9, oh sorry, section 2.7. Uh, um, calls for a specific composition of roof, certain T landmark TL composition. I was just wondering, is that too specific for a standard that we're trying to make be forever? I, I, I have 2.7, it's 2.7. Oh, on the red one. I, I'm looking at the red version. I see Ira shaking his head no. Okay, again, I'm just, you know, you know, maybe it could be referenced something like certainty or something, or maybe as a minimum, something like that. Yeah, just a thought. Um, again, I'm, you know, I, I know that one of the things that the ACSC is trying to do is to make these documents such that they don't need to be updated as materials and codes change. So that was just a thought. So, if I may, uh, Mr. President, I believe that. Sometime a few years ago, uh, a presentation was made that the different materials were evaluated and uh, that this specific material was selected as one that satisfies all of the requirements of the mutual. Uh, we can certainly go back and uh, uh, review uh, that review of materials and open it up to other materials that will meet the requirements of the mutual. Okay, that's just a for thought. Um, now moving to 2.9. So 2.9 mentions a bunch of clearances. You know, the panels must be 10 inches higher than the roof, but lower than the parapet. I just wanted to confirm that all of our manors um, are such, all of our flat roof manors are such that they have a parapet that's over 10 inches high. <clears throat> uh, from what I have seen, they all do, okay. and uh, what this is trying to do is to just to keep these out of sight. And, and understand, yeah. I just don't want to have a uh, a standard that can't be followed. Understood. Uh, so I just, if you're confident, then that's fine. You, you know the roofs better than I. Uh, 2.14 states that the installer is responsible for maintaining the waterproof integrity of the roof. How is that confirmed? And that is where the, the selection of the roofing contractor becomes critical. Uh, depending on the age of the roof, uh, we have the different uh, criteria that they have to meet, but all of them require that, one, that they be uh, licensed roofing contractors and that they perform the work per industry standards. And that's where in the industry standards specifies how uh, penetrations are to be sealed and to uh, prevent any uh, water from infiltrating into uh, the underlayment and the structure below. 
Okay, I mean, I hear that what you just said is different than to me, the installer is responsible for maintaining the waterproof integrity of the roof. Um, and again, I'm just wondering if, you know, the next rain, um, nine months later, a, a leak is found um, in that roof where is there assumptions made? Um, is there a way that we can inspect and as part of the inspection to ensure that the waterproof integrity of the roof is maintained and is that inspectable? I just, it's a statement that I'm just wondering how we are able to ensure that this is done. And, and, and it is, it's uh, upon notification of a uh, uh, water leak, staff will uh, physically uh, go to the site and evaluate what is what is causing the leak, and while they do that, they will note, they will note if they, it is due to alteration or it isn't. If it is due to an alteration, that's when uh, we bring the uh, member uh, into the picture. Uh, if it isn't, then our roofing contractor will perform the repairs. But yes, there is a, uh, a sequence of steps that are taken to identify the source of the uh, uh, water leak and uh, responsibility for such a leak. Okay, I'll get to you in a second, Jules. Um, uh, okay, I mean, you know, but if, but if the installer isn't in business anymore, it's really the member who's responsible Correct. for that. You know, so, um, um, you know, and uh, so, all right, okay. Um, I, I think that's all I had. So I'm gonna go to Kush first, just because he had his hand up first, and then Jules will get to you, and then anybody others. So Kush, are you still there? Did you have some questions or comments? Yes, thank you. I was wondering, I know Jim explained about this gas pipeline that his uncle went through, but suppose uh, my building is an eight unit building and uh, I was the first one who wanted the solar panels and by the time the next person realizes and or wants to do it, uh, I may have already passed on and who does the money go to if nobody is occupying my unit and I've gone to my maker's house? This is only single story. Uh, yeah, so, so, I mean, that's a... Um, How do I recover that money? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think the, the comment here from, from Jim and others is this is only single story units, but it still could apply in a three, du even a duplex, a two thing. Somebody pays for the roof. Really? Um, I was saying no. It, no. So, I don't, uh, and Bart, I'll have to confirm this. I don't believe there are any shared roofs uh, on any single story, single unit, duplex, triplex, or quadplex. They're all individual. I, I, I think it would be rare, if there are any at all, that are shared roofs between two units. Mine uh, is an eight unit building. That, that's two story, Kush. Two story, yeah. Yes. No, we're, this is only one story. The, this this policy we're talking about Kush, is for one story buildings only, at oh, this time. Okay. Now that being said, it sounds like we want to put this statement into when we get to forty one A and B. Um, so we're going to need to address Kush's question somewhere mm -hmm. along the line. So Kush, thanks for the question. It was a good one. Um, I see Jim taking it down. So. Um, it'll be figured out uh, in the next version for multi-story buildings. Good to know. Okay, yeah. thank, thank, thank Jules, you. Jules, you had a comment or question? Yes, I'm going to follow up on a question that Mark had. How is it enforced? For example, there is a leak in a, in a roof in which the uh, installer is responsible. Is there a bond? Is there an insurance policy? How is it enforced? So if it is determined that the uh, water leak is due to an alteration, and since the roof is common area, one of the first steps that we do is to uh, work with the member to sign a, uh, a license to allow them to have the roofing system. And that makes them responsible for any future maintenance uh, for as long as that roofing system, that uh, solar panel system is in place. So once it is determined that it is due to an alteration, we have that 
uh, as one of the tools to uh, go back to the member and uh, request that this, if it is done as a chargeable service, that they reimburse the mutual. If it is uh, work that needs to be done and there is time to do that, we will secure that leak and allow the uh, licensed contractor to perform the, uh, those repairs. But we go back to the member. So if there was damage, it would seem to be to everyone's advantage that there be a written contract between the member and the contractor, which would be enforceable by our executive committee to enforce a a reimbursement or uh, uh, impose legal responsibility on that contractor, wouldn't it? That would be wise for the member to do that. Well, I bring to everyone's attention the fact that that is exactly what was submitted and in the uh, uh, HCFC. So I would encourage the committee to uh, bring it up again and perhaps pass it. Thank you. Okay, Jim, you have anything to say? Well, just, just that the contract is between the member and the contractor. We, as the HOA, aren't part of that contract. But I agree with you that they should have a contract, and that proposal, one-page contract that they could have is supposed to be put in our packet, right. the information packet with the application for a variance or for an MC. Yeah, I, I just add one thing, and that is our bylaws actually provide right now that our executive committee could, if we wished, take responsibility and have jurisdiction to actually impose liability on the contractor. And uh, I would, uh, now that we're talking about it, I will re-raise the subject and maybe we can talk about it in board. Thank you. Thanks. All right, any other questions, comments for Bart before we proceed on this? Okay, seeing none, I'm not sure what kind of motion I'm looking for. So I mean, I, you know, we can get a motion to approve this for 28 day review and approval, a motion to send it back to committee if people think there were enough questions and, and um, uh, but, uh, or, or, or little of both. 28 day approval and try to tweak it between now and then. Jim? I make a motion to approve with the little tweaks that Bart took notes on from the questions that were asked to move it forward. Okay, we have a motion. Ira seconds. Okay. Um, any discussion of the board on that? All right. Um, okay. All right. I think we should uh, move forward and one of the things that was left out is that the requirements on a single level um, home to put on solar, and I'll use me, myself as an example, it's required by Third Mutual for me to put a new roof underneath that solar before it's put up. The CULA that goes along with it says I'm totally responsible. Also, the requirements are already in place under, I forget which uh, policy that goes with this, that states that the roofer must um, ensure parts and labor, if you will, uh, against leaks for the first five years, just as we would have that. So all these things are in place that we didn't talk about already. Um, not that I particularly like having to pay for a new roof, um, but I understand it. But there's, there's other things in place that are already there to ensure that the member knows that he's responsible. Uh, in my case, I told the solar company to re-roof, so I only went back to one person or one, one entity rather than two. Um, so there, there's ways uh, an owner can protect themselves uh, beforehand. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments? All right. Um, any member comments? None? All right. Top time to vote. So again, we're voting to submit this updated policy with tweaks that hopefully Bart uh, was able to take down. Jim, I'm going to ask 
your help in making sure Bart got all of those. Um, I had a lot of questions. Let me know if you need my help. Um, um, this was a, and uh, we're submitting it for 28 day member review and approval. Hopefully we'll get the updated um, final version next time yeah, to finalize. All right, it looks like we're voting online here. Director Bada, can I get your vote? Vote is yes. Thank you. Director Engdahl? Thank you. I've lost my screen. I saw this case gives us a thumbs up as thumbs well. Up. Okay, perfect. So we're uh, getting unanimous here. So thank you, board. Um, and uh, hopefully we can get that updated version soon. Moving on to agenda item 13C. This is for the board to hear about and discuss a proposal from our landscape chair, Ira Lewis. Ira, what have you got for us today? Okay, changing gears here. Okay, as Mark mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, uh, I'm gonna explain the background and basic features of the proposed landscaping prior and post paint program. Uh, basically, this idea was born from my observations in uh, various areas of Third Mutual that residents have complained to me about, and uh, just familiarizing myself with parts of Third that I generally don't go to. Um, one common issue I found was landscape damage surrounding buildings that were just reconditioned and painted. And so with the need to modernize, update, upgrade our landscaping to today's standards and tomorrow's needs, I'm proposing a program that would proceed the restoration and paint teams by removing all of the older, inappropriate, inefficient, not for this geographical area shrubbery around the building that is to be reconditioned. This will give the crews unblocked access to do their jobs better and more efficiently, and this does provide some savings. When the crews have finished the repairs and painting, landscaping will come in to adjust the irrigation, regrade as needed around the building, and install a new professionally designed landscape. The landscape plants installed will all be water-wise, drought-tolerant, and the plantings will conform to the latest Orange County Fire Authority guidelines and requirements. With the benefits of hardening our landscape against fire, reducing costs for maintenance, and reducing water consumption. With the reduction of maintenance labor requirements, it'll enable landscape staff to work more on weed reduction and control long-term costs. This will save money and improve the appearance of our community. By updating the plantings to water-wise with the correct spacing away from our buildings, we will reduce moisture levels at the base of the buildings, thus reducing damage to the building slabs as well as the paint and stucco on all our buildings. Also, uh, due to the reduced moisture levels, we'll benefit from a reduction in termite habitat, therefore reducing the damage and repairs caused by these pests, all of which save money. This program would run separately from our turf reduction program, which also has similar <laughs> benefits. Additionally, if a building needs to be tented for fumigation, this program will eliminate any landscape prep or reconditioning for the service, again, saving a little bit of money on money and creating some efficiencies. In summary, the long-term benefits from this program along with our ongoing turf reduction program are very much needed to help keep costs for third mutual in check and on an eventual downward path rather than spiraling upward every year. So I'm happy to say that the landscape department has embraced this program in a very positive way and staff is currently compiling an analysis of costs and benefits to this program in order for the third board to decide if they want to put it in next year's budget. And so as more information becomes available, I will continue to keep the board and the community updated. So that's really all I have for today. Great, thanks, thanks Ira. Anybody have any comments or questions for Ira on it? Okay, Moon? Ira. Yes, I do. Okay, yeah, just a second, Kush. And we'll Moon first. Oh. All right, we are not going to do whole third mutual at once, right? So it, this is going to be many, many years of gradual project. The, the, this is the, uh, as, I, as I stated, the, it's prior and post painting, so it's going to be just ahead and behind 
of the current painting schedule. So we're on a 15-year schedule, so this is how long it would take. So, so what I worry about, the money issue. So, you know, are we 15 years, we can spread out for 15 years to do money? Well, this is what staff cost. is compiling right now. Mm -hmm. How much it's going to cost per each year because there's a different number of buildings that need to be painted with a different number of square footage area around each building. And uh, uh, some years are more buildings, some years less. Uh, but the average is roughly six and three quarter percent of the community every year. And moving forward, as we reduce our water needs, reduce our labor needs, this will reduce our costs. And the hopes are, uh, when we get the numbers back, we'll be able to see the tipping point of the program where it'll start to pay for itself. And we won't have to put in, like every program to start, you need to put in some seed money uh, to get it going. And um, all these numbers, are st we're still waiting to, to see. Because this, as you can see, I just kind of quickly went over the, the summary of it. But it touches a lot of different things in MNC from um, painting, restoration, fumigation, um, then having to calculate out the savings in labor moving forward because we'll be able to reduce um, uh, cycles in those areas because the plants just won't need the attention. And uh, how much labor is going to be reduced, how much water is going to be reduced. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, moving parts to this. Yeah, I would like to add that drainage issue at the same time. Well, so this, this, they... this was incorporated. This was uh, regrading was, was yeah. the, uh, okay. uh, before you put in the new plants to make sure that the grade is, is correct. Because over time, um, in every community, when you have a bush, a tree, the ground raises up in the wrong area and moves the water in a different direction. So this is, this is to correct 50 to 60 years worth of problems that have built up over time in that respect. Great, thanks. Kush, you had a comment or question? Uh, yes, please. Ira, this is a very, very well thought of and good idea. But my concern is that uh, if we have a 15-year cycle for painting, and uh, that means we are going to do about 96 buildings on a rough calculation per year, will we be able to manage this scope of work and uh, in the first year, it definitely would be a lot of money investment. But when will it be the point when the investment that we make to change this from the current style of planting to the new style, when it is going to pay us back? Will that be calculated in the staff work workings? Yes, it will. That's what we're waiting for, to see how much labor savings, as I was just telling Moon, how much labor savings we're going to get how much uh, uh, savings from the different entities that uh, no longer would have to prep a building uh, for painting, prep a building for restoration, prep a building for uh, fumigation, and then restore a building after the fact. Um, also, there's going to be some other uncalculated but additional savings because if we reduce termite habitat and we reduce moisture around buildings, we're no longer going to have as, as many tentings as needed because there won't be as much termite damage. We won't have the, the moisture levels that uh, was just brought up this morning by Larry Halperin. Um, hopefully that there's excessive moisture in a slab because we've re regraded around the buildings to get the moisture away. We have new methods of applying mulch, which uh, keep it six inches away from the building. Again, all to reduce moisture levels, which reduce all these things that probably won't get calculated in up front, but will make an impact later on in savings uh, over and above what we've calcul hopefully calculated. Um, so we're, we're all waiting for uh, uh, Kurt, who's sitting back there patiently to uh, be able to... Th there's just a lot of moving parts in this, and it does take some time to figure it out, and you're, you want to figure it out for 15 years, and on average, we're going to be having uh, 400 units a year being done. It's a big task. We'll be going to the outside for help because our crews cannot do this. 
um, and it'll be an ongoing situation where uh, on a workday schedule, once this gets, gets going, hopefully, you're talking about two units a day being done. And it might not sound like much, but 400 units a year, it's, it's quite a bit. And uh, this will hopefully erase the sins of um, trees growing, um, rem changing the way water flows around buildings, and uh, just save us money moving forward and, keeping, and make the, the community um, updated, <coughs> upgraded, and um, more pleasant to look at. Good, good. And, yeah, just a comment on your 400 units. Um, you know, it's not 400 buildings. So no. You were talking about 400 manors, given the 15 years divided by the 6,000 units we have. But as uh, you know, it's it's approximately 96, as I think Kush mentioned, buildings on an average a year. Um, so um, good. I, I I like the proposal. I'm looking forward to the more details. And, <laughs> so uh, am I. <laughs> as, as we proceed, any other questions, comments? Mark, my final sentence, if you don't mind. We, we can hardly hear you. Could you speak a little louder for us? Okay. My, what I'm saying is we will have 15 years of pain to go through financially and uh, whichever way it is considered. But ultimately, after 15 years, it will be very good. It will be uh, pleasant to look at as well as uh, money saving in many, many ways. Yeah, great idea, Ira. Yeah, yeah. Hope, yeah hope, hopefully, it'll pay for, start paying for itself well before the fifteen years. Yes, I, my, that's a, my hopes as well. That's yeah. right. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you for uh, bringing that and sharing that with the board and the members. Um, all right. I see no more questions on this, so I'm going to move on to agenda item 14. This is where the members of this board will share our monthly committee updates for third mutual, starting with the report of the Finance Committee. Donna? Thank you. And the Finance Committee, as is its habit of meeting on the first Tuesday every other month, starting with the month of February, so people can kind of, in their minds, schedule when those meetings will happen. Um, we met on the 4th of April. Because that is so close to the end of March, our statements today really only go through February 28th. So just so the people know why we're talking about February's dates. We met on April 4th, but I do want to share with you that on April 6th was a pretty important date because we received our audit report and there were no issues found by the auditors. They looked at how we keep our records, they looked at how we plan various things and didn't bring up any issues at all. So with that, we've sort of cleared out last year and we're ready to go full bore into budget season right now. The prelude to that was that the Finance Committee, and to remind everybody, the Finance Committee is a committee of the whole, so the board gets to hear all of the presentations to the Finance Committee. We've already heard from those departments that have expenditures in terms of what their staffing needs are, what they see, how they run. You know, just what is involved in that particular department. They didn't present budgets. That comes next. They just let us know how they run, what they see as their needs, the number of staff they've used, materials, et cetera. The next phase of budget, which is going to go on until we finalize it, we will have meetings where those departments will now come to us with their first shot at what they need and see, feel they need for next year. We'll discuss it with them, go over things with them, and as usually is the case, ask them to go back to the drawing board and sharpen their pencils again. We'll let them know if there are things we think should have been included that weren't and things that maybe were included that ask them how things would run if they were not included. So that will happen and throughout the summer into the fall we will have three different very large meetings and each time things will be refined until we get to that final meeting and the budget is prepared. So I wanted to make sure that people were brought into the loop and aware. Closely related to that, since we're talking about the budget season, 
Um, it's very exciting to know that we have the Bright Ideas program. Over the years, we have had amazing suggestions from staff that have resulted in thousands of dollars of savings. In fact, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings. And so it, it, it's nice that we can thank them for an idea that actually works and helps us. The suggestion I also heard today was that we perhaps have one for our residents and members. Actually, in a way, we do, because any suggestion that a member makes, if it turns out to be a money saver, automatically comes back to us right away. So I would like to encourage if someone who is a member has a suggestion that they feel would save money, there's many avenues to communicate. They could send an email. They can come to a meeting and, and during member comments make their suggestion. Any of these things could happen. And since we're in budget season starting today, right now, um, hearing this, I don't want to wait until we develop some kind of a program because, again, as I say, we all benefit anytime there is a suggestion that helps us save money. And for staff, it's really great when they do it because that suggestion doesn't affect their salary or their lifestyle, but it does affect ours. And so, again, I encourage that. So moving on from that, that was just a, a comment to get you all in the proper frame of mind for our budget season. Um, we want to start with the report itself. And the first, this first slide is just that 30,000-foot view, which is an income and, and um, expense statement that puts all of our funds together and just tells you how much we brought in, how much went out, Total revenue was $7.3 million, total expense, against total expenses of five point, essentially $5.5 million, and leaving a net revenue of $1,846,000. It doesn't tell you where, it just tells you what the big bucket is. So let's move on and take a look at a specific fund, and that's our operating budget, and that's really important. This is the budget that is put together, that we're going to be working so hard on with as we proceed through budget season. These are the expenses we anticipate. This is, this is how we plan for the year and what we expect to happen. And so as we look at our operating income, assessment revenue, as you can see, was four point, almost $4.8 million. Uh, non-assessment revenue, certainly very much smaller at 319000 So that our total overall revenue for the operating uh, budget was approximately uh, $5 million income. Total expenses against $4.4 million, leaving us an operating surplus of $695,000. And that is, it, it's actually quite close to budget when we think about it. Um, we have a little surplus, but it's early in the year, and there's usually a lag in um, statements and, and in actually getting invoices. So it's not unusual to be a little ahead and have some surplus. So let's move on and start looking at budget and how we compare to it. Our, again, our overall income, as you saw in the first slide, was $6.9 million dollars right on the, on the mar market for uh, what was budgeted. It's what we expected. Our non-assessment revenue was a little bit smaller. Um, and some of that has to do with having um, some fewer lease um, agreements, fees for that, sales in real estate, some of the ways in which we get non-assessment revenue. And uh, again, total revenue, exactly what we already heard with a very small variance from budget. And if we look at our net revenue, again, we have a very favorable variance. Um, we, had, we were left with $1.8 million. We assumed we would only have 494000 so that surplus of $1.3 million. But again, much of that is due to the fact that there is a delay in receiving invoices, although work is actually underway. So let's move on. Slide number four. Always my favorite one because it's so easy when it's a graph like this. And I always like it when most of it is on the green side, meaning favorable to budget. Outside services are favorable to the tune of $784,000. Primarily, that's got to do with what I already mentioned, the timing of payments. Um, the work has been done. We haven't gotten or, or paid the bills yet. 
So uh, work is proceeding. Uh, waste line remediation, water line copper pipe remediation, tree maintenance are all in process and we're awaiting processing of invoices. If we move to co employee compensation, that's a little bit different because some of that favorable variance is primarily due to open positions in both maintenance and construction and landscape. Very great efforts are being made to fill those positions that have been determined are needed and um, we hope to have those filled as soon as possible. Utilities, for the first time in a while, is now on the green side, and that's very nice to see. That's been a, it's been a red bar for a little bit, and that primarily was um, utilities rather than water. We have utilities, water, and electric, and we are 90,000 in the green. Primarily, that is from water savings. Uh, electric hasn't really gone down. And we know that landscaping uh, did very, very well because Mother Nature got a little bit crazy and endowed us with more water than we knew what to do with. And so virtually, they have essentially not had to water since the beginning of the year. If so, it's been very, very limited basis. But I want to share with you that a great deal of that has to do with what our residents have done. Third mutual residence from January 1 of 2020, 2022 to December 31st saved in residential water, which we are able to separate out from landscape water, the residents saved 14,440,000 gallons of water. That's huge. Not only is it a lot of water when we need it, and we will need it again, but I always like to remind everybody, our potable water, that residential water, comes from somewhere else. We do not have a natural source of it in this part of Orange County, and that means we purchase it, and we purchase it from places that are far away, either Northern California or Colorado River, and it's very expensive to transport. So that's why it's sitting in the treasurer's report, because it is very expensive to purchase and transport that water. And so thank you to everybody. Thank you, to, I think, to Mother Nature. She didn't have to quite go so crazy, but um, for the landscaping savings, and thank you to the residents. Please keep it up. We will continue to need that, and so keep up those water savings functions you've done. The miscellaneous resident is down by $37,000, and that is really unfavorable due to fewer resale processing fees and a few less leasing fees. Uh, there are fewer units on the market right now, partly because of the higher interest rates, and so that is something that varies, but it's a very small amount. Moving on. To the next slide. These pies are always extremely helpful in letting us know the percentage of our expenses where they hit. And chargeable services in terms of our revenues is the biggest part of our revenues that are non-assessment. Almost 40% of our non-assessment revenue comes from chargeable services. Investment interest income has been very good. That's another 20%. So we're talking about two-thirds of our non-assessment revenue coming from chargeable services and investment interest. To a smaller degree, we can see laundry revenue, permits, uh, late fees, golf cart electric fees on a very, very small percentage and in inspections. But um, I think it's really helpful for us to be able to see where that money comes from. And if we move on, let's look at our expenses in a similar manner. Fully more than two-thirds of our expenses come from employee compensation and those related to it, such as benefits, et cetera, and insurance, with 36% of our uh, total expenses coming from employee compensation and the related expenses, and 27% from insurance. Third, utilities, 15%. So again, very important that we keep an eye on that. It's still a significant amount. And then as you can see, outside services, materials, et cetera, to a much smaller extent but that is how our total expenses kind of evolve. If we move on to the next slide. Here we have our non-operating fund balances. We looked first at operating what we expect. These are the things that we hold in reserve. Our replacement funds began the year with $21 million and ended the year at a little over $22 million, and we do like to see that reserve fund growing. Garden Villa Fund is a very small fund. It is um, 
money that the Garden Villa residents pay for things like maintaining their rec rooms, et cetera, expenses that they have that others do not, and, and others can't use those rec rooms, so the fee goes there. And again, it went from 111000 as a as a balance to 124000 So we always like to see those funds a little higher at the end of the year. The disaster fund continues to maintain and be growing a little bit. And uh, unappropriate expenditures, that's a fancy way of saying our contingency fund. Those expenses that we know something's going to happen that we're going to have to pay for, but we can't always anticipate exactly what. And again, the contingency fund, even at the end of a year now, we're looking at February 28th, the first two months, to holds very steadily. And so we have a total, we, we began with $31.4 million in these other funds and ended with a 32.6 million. So each of those are stable, and that's good to see. The very next slide, as we conclude the report, the very next slide is just showing the same thing in a bar graph from 2019 all the way to 2023, and you can see the growth of our replacement funds, which is what we want to see. You can see the stability of the disaster fund. It was higher in 2019 and has gone down a little bit. Some of that happened in 2021. It shrunk when we had that surprise insurance bill and were permitted to take some of that money out of the disaster fund. We're putting it back in steadily. There is no real need at this point to return that fund balance to where it was in 2019 because we now have earthquake insurance, which we didn't have. And that fund was seen as a way to help cover earthquake losses. And then across the top, there's a very light sort of olive green line. It almost just looks like one of the, the graph lines. And that is the Garden Villa Recreation Room Fund. I always like to point it out because people think we've left it off the chart. But um, it is there. And with that, we conclude the report with the very next slide, which is actually our resale history. I um, have already mentioned that there have been fewer resales this year, fewer fewer manners on the market. And, but if you look, the, the history is almost, almost identical to in terms of average resale price in the upper corner there, almost the same exactly as it was a year ago. And with that, that concludes my report. Uh, our next meeting, in keeping with our schedule, will be the first Tuesday of June. And we invite you all to attend. It's held here in the boardroom. Okay, any thank questions? You. Thank you, Donna. All right. Don't see any questions. We're going to move on to the Architectural and Control and Standards Committee. Jim? Thank you, Mark. Uh, our committee met on April 10th. Uh, we want to welcome a new resale inspector, uh, David Rouge, that we've got. So that should expedite uh, resale. We also had four variance items that we've discussed and we're on the consent calendar today that were approved. Uh, items for discussion, as we looked at architectural standard 41, much discussion today, so the discussion was about the same as what it was for our committee, so no need to go over that. We come to the other item of architectural standard 31, washer and dryer installations. We looked at that. We had moved that to future business because we wanted to tweak it some. We are trying to get a survey of the Garden Villa's residents to see what the overall understanding is and what they want and what they don't want. We're looking at it as a point of view that there has to be an education process to inform the membership how the new washer models are safer and quieter. The, uh, Washers, what we also included in section 2.6 was they should not exceed 73 decibel rating. Uh, the 73 decibel rating was looked at because in these high efficiency, small apartment style washing machines, that was the level that anything below that would be able to be used as one of the washers. And that'll be part of the education process in showing what we're talking about on these apartment style washers and dryers. These are not full size washers and dryers. And I think that part of the education process has not occurred with the garden villas. Uh, if you're pro washers and dryers in the 
three-story buildings or anti-washer dryers in the three-story buildings. You can attend the Garden Villas meeting on May 11th at 10 a.m. And you can come there and either get educated or beat up on me or whatever. I will be there at that meeting for you to ask questions and try and come up with the answers and understand that we have looked at all aspects of this. We're not just arbitrarily saying, yes, we're going to put washers and dryers in the three-story buildings. As far as other things that will be going on with the ACSC, uh, Mr. Horton, who is one of the new people at uh, Alterations, we have already pushed forward and are moving a lot of the things that are responsibility of the city to the city. They're not the HOA's actual responsibility, such as asbestos abatement and that. So working with uh, Bart Mejia and Mr. Horton and myself, we're putting all those things on the ACSC agendas to try and move forward and take a lot of the complication out of having double, double jeopardy, as it were, for having the HOA dealing with it and the city dealing with it when a lot of it should be, is to be placed on the city and not an HOA responsibility. Our next meeting will be on I know it's here somewhere. Uh, May 8th at 1.30 p.m. in the boardroom. And that concludes my report. Any questions from anybody? All right. Thanks, Jim. All right. uh, next, we'll hear about what's going on with the third maintenance and construction committee. Ralph, have any updates um, for us? Since we only meet every, every two months, we uh, our last meeting was way back on March 6th. Uh, since then, we've been busy keeping stuff keeping stuff moving that we talked about then. Uh, our next regular meeting will be next uh, May Day. That's May 1st. Come and join the party. And uh, you're, you're all welcome to come and see that. And I hope you'll have a lot of good information reporting on things that have been accomplished by that time. Yes, hope so. Next meeting, May Day. Okay, all right. Uh, next we'll hear about the Third Landscape Committee, Ira. Okay, so we met uh, Thursday, April 6th here in the boardroom at 9.30, and uh, as you saw in today's calendar, we had a number of tree removals and alteration requests done. I think there were half a dozen or eight of them. Um, we were also given uh, by Head of Landscaping more areas to choose for turf reduction to try and save, uh, again, labor, maintenance time, water, um, for the community uh, that we'll be selecting next time. That was homework. And uh, we did approve the, uh, the new committee charter and uh, uh, we'll be working on the landscape manual um, now and next time. And uh, our next meeting will be on Thursday, May 4th at 9.30 a.m. here in the boardroom. I can't count, right? Thank you, Ira. Um, is there anything new to be shared regarding Water Conservation Committee? Yes. Um, of course, I've already shared how much residential water our residents have saved. We need to keep it up, both for financial reasons as well as for that precious commodity. Um, we will be meeting on April 27th, and we only meet quarterly. So I urge anybody, we really love people to come. The agenda shows that it's going to be in the Elm Room, but that has moved back to the Sycamore Room which is on the second floor. We moved it down to the Elm Room because Elm Room, we wanted it to be more available for people to just walk in. We love people to come to the meetings, but it isn't as good a room for uh, Zoom, for virtual, and, and so we're going back up to the second floor. That is not to discourage people from coming. We would like them to just let the folks at the reception desk know out in the lobby that you're coming to that meeting and they'll get you in the elevator and, and up to it. And so that the other thing that I would like to point out is this coming Thursday on October the 20th is Earth Day. 
and closely related, obviously, to water conservation. And I, I, although that is being done by concerned citizens, we would like to urge any of our members of Third Mutual to attend. It's from 1 to 4 at Clubhouse 1. And <clears throat> that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, we have the Resident Policy and Compliance Committee. This committee last met on Wednesday, March 29th. <laughs> where we discussed potential updates to thirds appeals policy, our compliance letters, and our internal dispute resolution policy, um, all in the effort to make things kinder, gentler, more clear for our members. Uh, this committee will next meet a uh, week from today, uh, next Tuesday, April 25th at 9.30 a.m. here in the boardroom, where we plan to continue our discussion on the appeals policy, compliance letters, and internal dispute resolution policy, but we'll also hope to talk about our barbecue policy as well as our lease policy, which is undergoing changes as a result of new state laws that become effective this year. Uh, any questions on resident policy and compliance? All right. That's all we have for third mutual committees. Now we'll move on to agenda item 15, where we'll share our monthly GRF committee status update, starting with the GRF Community Activities Committee. Kush, are you available to give that? Yes. Um, I am not as well prepared like I am usually because of some family emergency. But in any case, um, the committee meeting took place on April 13th at the boardroom. Uh, we did update, uh, sorry, we did approve the Aquadets uh, request for their poster policy. Uh, we did also approve the Hearing Well Club request for installing a hearing loop in the Elm Room. Uh, we had a really, uh, what can I say, a lot of attendance from the residents regarding the, the reservation fees increase. And ultimately, we did uh, decline to approve it. Uh, so uh, so that was the main part of this uh, meeting. I also want to remind all the people that some of our events are still going on. The Tony Orlando show is coming up uh, May 6th at the Performing Arts Center and the um, uh, Memorial Day concert at the PSC at 1 p.m. on May 29th. Oh, that's a long ways away. So, in any case, a lot of activity going on. Please refer to the recreation dashboard for more information. Our next meeting for the CAC committee is going to be on uh, May 11th at 1.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Thank you. Thank you, Kush. Um, I'm actually moving on now to website ad hoc committee, Donna. Yeah, that committee just met last week on April the 12th, working very hard um, reviewing proposals for websites from those who create them and hopefully very close to a decision. Um, and the next meeting will be announced when we're ready. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. Um, and what's the latest regarding the GRF Broadband Ad Hoc Committee, Chris? Well, uh, the GRF Broadband Ad Hoc Committee held a closed meeting on April 3rd, where an expert presented on certain aspects of the community uh, committee's outreach. The me meeting previously scheduled for April 17th was canceled, and the next closed meeting is scheduled for April 25th at 10 a.m. in the Sycamore Room. Okay. Good. Um, what's happening with the GRF Maintenance and Construction and Clubhouse Renovations Committee, Ralph? Any updates for us? Yeah, the, uh, we do have on this the last meeting of the uh, GRF MNC Committee. It was was April uh, 12. Uh, they pulled a couple of things from the uh, consent calendar for further discussion. Namely, uh, there's more cons more talk on the GRF Charge Point program possible reevaluation of the actual charges that are being made. Um, proposed uh, clubhouse preventive maintenance pro program inspection report, which is uh, in process of being revised, so they'll check those things periodically. 
Uh, Guy West included uh, additional items and answered questions, including the 2023 GRF seal coat program on a seven-year cycle and status update of several items on the, on the MNC project log, specifically uh, regarding storage of swimming pool chemicals, uh, details uh, regarding the equestrian center, the driving range status, which is now closed and probably <coughs> won't open until maybe August or September, maybe later. Um, also, uh, they discussed the needed changes to accommodate some of the newly mandated electrical landscape equipment. Uh, they'll have to get some more chargers and so forth. The uh, also, they discussed the transition to the temporary office lease across the parking lot here, and uh, Building E is no longer occupied. I haven't heard whether, whether it fell down the last time they slammed the door or not, but we were afraid of that. <laughs> the overall space study program uh, contract is nearly complete and should be presented in early May. Next regular meeting of GRF MNC is scheduled for June 14. Uh, Clubhouse Renovation Committee, we had two meetings, uh, the 6th and the 15th of March. Both meetings had essentially the same purpose, that is to present the uh, proposed color palettes to the board for approval. The uh, first meeting was online, so colors were a little bit questionable. So the second meeting on the 15th, we've actually had here in this room with the color panels were actually here and we could see the uh, samples of the materials that are proposed. Uh, there was a, an informal vote among everybody who attended. It was an open meeting, by the way. And then, uh, then the board uh, made a vote and came up with uh, a color palette and uh, some of the details will be developed or will be developed a little later. Uh, we went into selection of some kind of lighting equipment, uh, at least in general sense, for for the uh, uh, the main ballroom and also for the uh, um, I guess the multi-purpose room is what it would be, and. Uh, also, a uh, little discussion on window coverings in a kind of a generic sense, uh, rather than heavy drapes, are going to go to a more rolling shade thing. Probably two kinds will be able ability for room darkening, as well as uh, just subdued lighting. Anyway, the next meeting will, well, that's to be determined yet. That has not been set. All right. Thanks, Ron. A lot going on there. The next we have the GRF Compliance Ad Hoc Committee. Chris? Uh, yes, the GRF Compliance Ad Hoc Committee held an open meeting at 1.30 p.m. on April 3rd. The committee continues to finesse certain documents, including the, the appeal, nuisance, and harassment policies, as well as the resolution establishing an executive committee, excuse me, an executive hearings committee. The committee will give its final review at the next committee meeting, which is scheduled for May 3rd at 1.30 p.m. in the second war room. Okay, thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, next, we have an update regarding the Disaster Preparedness Task Force, SK. Yes, the task force meeting was held on March 28th in your boardroom, and the report, staff reports were made, such as low, ra uh, low radio and communication participant, about 50%, was due to some confusion of the drill week and the radio issues. And also disaster preparedness supplies are running low and required need to be re replenished as soon as possible. And the discussion was made uh, initiating the culture of the prepared, uh, preparedness and also discuss about the Good Neighbor Captain program. And we mainly, uh, normally we discuss about fire and earthquake preparedness, but this time we add earth, uh, the tornado issue. So since we had a tornado in the Northern California, we add tornado drill 
uh, discussion about the tornado preparedness, and uh, some uh, members pointed out that the, a bathroom would be a good a shelter for that event. And the next meeting is scheduled on May 30th, 2023. That was it. Thank you, SK. Um, what's the latest regarding purchasing ad hoc committee? Uh, that committee met twice in March, actually, both on the 8th and again on the 22nd, continuing to work on refining the purchasing processes. Uh, and the next meeting will be announced. Okay. And next we have the update of the Information Technology Advisory Committee. Uh, this committee, known as ITAC, currently meets monthly and last met on Friday, March 31st. This committee is currently overseeing the efforts to replace most of our uh, many old tools and systems with a single automated tool that will be used by staff, members, and residents to track all requests and activities and to support the day-to-day -day <laughs> operations of the village. The first phase of this effort will focus on the, our accounting tools and is expected to go live later this year. This effort is still in the design and development phase where the development team consisting of consultants as well as VMS staff um, are demoing the functionality of the new tool to confirm it's meeting our requirements and where it is not, the consultants tweak it a bit as necessary until it does meet our requirements. This process is expected to take another month or two to complete. And the ITAC is scheduled to meet next on Friday, April 28th. And finally, the following GRF committees have not met since the third board meeting last met on March 21st, so there are no updates for these. The GRF Finance Committee, uh, that committee last met on February 15th and is scheduled to next meet tomorrow, yes. April 19th at 1.30 p.m. here in the boardroom. The GRF Security and Community the Access Committee last met on February 27th and is scheduled to next meet on April 26th at 1.30 p.m. here in the boardroom. The GRF Media and Communications Committee last met on March 20th and is scheduled to next meet on May 15th at 1.30 p.m. here in the boardroom. The GRF Mobility and Vehicles Committee last met on February 1st and is scheduled to next meet on June 7th at 1.30 p.m. here in the boardroom. And finally, the Laguna Woods traffic hearings uh, were last held on March 15th, and the next uh, hearings are scheduled for tomorrow, April 19th. That com concludes our committee reports, and we're now on to agenda item 16, which is for the board to note of any items they'd like to be discussed at a future board meeting. So far on our list, we have the revision to Architectural Standard 41 solar panels for one-story buildings that we discussed earlier today and agreed to place on 28-day notice with some tweaks to allow member review and comment. We also moved the revision to Architectural Standard 31 for washers and dryers to a future agenda topic. And are there any other items that anyone would like to add? Okay, looking around, seeing none, everybody's getting hungry. All right, um, we'll then move on to agenda item 17, which is director's comments. Do any directors have any uh, final comments regarding the items discussed today that they'd like to share? SK, we'll start with you. Any final comments? None? Andy, nothing? Moon? None? Jules? Yes, I just want to underscore the comments I made before about how important it is to show respect for our members and the fact that you and Michaela uh, uh, went out of your way to uh, recognize that is, I think, very helpful to our community and our relationship to the membership. Thank you. Thanks. Ira, anything? Nothing? Ralph? Nothing, nothing, thank okay. you. Okay. Jim, nothing. nothing? Chris? Nothing. No, Donna? Okay. okay, staff? All right. And uh, Kush. Kush? Thank you. Could you have anything further? I'll assume not. Is he still on mute? Uh, not, nothing really. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Kush. Wasn't sure you were there, but thanks. Good. All right. I was, but by the time I got to the button, was okay. Not. All right. Anyway. All right. Thank you. Great. So uh, that uh, concludes the business of our open meeting. At this time, the monthly board meeting will recess for. Um, nine plus, uh, yeah, eight, uh, 19 minutes. So we'll meet at, uh, 1240, um, have a working lunch for our executive session. Um, thanks everybody for participating and thanks everybody for listening.
This meeting is now adjourned.